Okay, let, let's... Hello, ladies and gentlemen, we are here again for another session of the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. If you are dialing in for the first time, we meet every fortnight. This is a platform uh, that brings together healthcare professionals from Cameroon uh, who are spread across the world. And we all meet here to have conversation on different health topics that are of interest in improving the healthcare situation back home. Last week, we had as guest uh, Dr. Sidney Taze, who was uh, drilling us on uh, improving cancer care and reducing mortality in Cameroon. It was quite a really interesting session. And uh, today, of course, we always bring you the best of experts. We have never touched on occupational health before, and that's a very important topic. And uh, we had to search to get the best of uh, the best who can tell us about the state of occupational medicine in Cameroon. And this is no other person but Dr. Ekiti Martin. Ladies and gentlemen, as we prepare to have a very interesting conversation, I'll be co-moderating this session with uh, Dr. Brian Tegomo. Hi, Brian. Yeah, hi, hi, Elvis. It, uh, it's great to see you and hope, hope you all had a great, great week. I'm really excited about uh, today's uh, session. We haven't really had a chance to talk about the, the, the importance of uh, of occupational medicine in general. So I'm, I'm really thrilled uh, that we have someone who has had some great working experience in this domain and uh, really looking forward to an engaging uh, conversation. Really a very important topic. I remember when I left university, my first ever project I wrote was on occupational health. At that time, there was a road construction company in Cameroon called Coop. And I, I took it to them and said, hey, I want to be the one to provide healthcare in this year chantier here. And uh, they took the project, read it, and said, "No, we 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 don't need this for now." <laughs> so I know what occupational medicine can really mean, especially in those big corporations that are dealing with so many workers, especially those working under very hazardous uh, uh, circumstances. Of course, today we have as well Christelle, who is co-moderating. Uh, Christelle, bonjour. Bonjour, Elvis. Bonsoir. En fonction de où vous joignez euh, cet appel aujourd'hui, c'est un honneur renouvelé de vous avoir tous ces messieurs Dr. Ekiti d'avoir accepté notre invitation. À toi, Elvis. Merci, Christelle. And uh, Christelle, as far as occupational medicine is concerned, um, uh, what is, have you any little uh, experience you've had just maybe seeing some people who are unable to access care as workers in a corporation or have you been a victim? Just any thoughts on this topic, the relevance? Yeah, c'est très important, uh, definitely, uh, à la fin, parce que uh, c'est un sujet qui n'est pas très abordé aussi, beaucoup plus, plus en plus. C'est un peu rare de le voir dans, dans, en entreprise, même dans un corps professionnel, de voir que des gens s'intéressent à ce sujet, qui pourtant est très important. Donc, je crois qu'on va apprendre beaucoup de cette présentation, moi particulièrement, et c est, c est, je crois que c'est bien de l'avenir aussi dans ça. Merci. Je, vais, je suis à l'école aujourd'hui, je vais prendre beaucoup de notes. Oh, <laughs> we are all going to take a lot of notes because uh, Martin is not just uh, uh, someone who is knowledgeable in this sector, but he's someone who is also working in a very, very important uh, 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 corporation, that which has to do with, you know, hazardous uh, uh, second, uh, substances as well. And so he blends a mix, uh, he comes in with a blend of a person who understands occupational medicine, but practices it really at the heart of uh, a corporation like Sonora. So we hear more about who he is. Uh, let's listen to our chair, Dr. Mono. Hi, Mono. 
Oh, hi, Elvis, and uh, thank you very much for uh, always being around yourself and the other moderators and uh, everyone who was locked in here today. It's really a very important topic. I did have a little experience when I was working in Cameroon. I used to represent uh, the insurance company of uh, one of the big insurance company and insured several workers who were in Bamenda. So I was covering a lot of banks at the time. Uh, but never really understood what I was doing. I was just signing papers and trying to provide insurance for them. So today, too, I'm here to learn a lot. And uh, in my present uh, state, I don't really do much about occupational medicine. I'm more in clinic and uh, public health. So I was, I'm really here to learn also to know exactly what the state is in Cameroon. And uh, I've asked several, a lot of companies are really trying to to boost preventive medicine in Cameroon. I think they are the only ones really at the forefront of preventive medicine, those who are actually in these corporations and the occupational doctors that are controlling these corporations. So thank you, Elvis. Yes, um, so much to learn today. And uh, Chang Taka was really tuned in very early and I was like, okay, he, this must be a very interesting topic to him. Hi, Taka, some words. Hello guys, I'm sorry, I don't have my, my, <laughs> my video on. Yes, I think I'm, I'm, I'm here mostly as a spectator and to learn. Um, um, obviously, there are lots of differences um, between the, the United States and Cameroon. And I always wondered um, why we didn't, we didn't talk about this a lot while we were in Cameroon. So I'm just here to learn. And uh, additionally, I know the speaker. I think, I think before I left Cameroon, we met. And prior to that, he, I think at the time, he was not yet in medical school. So... I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he's, he's on the platform today and I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to learning from him. Wow, well, how much time has gone by? Uh, it's really surely an opportunity. That's why we like the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. This is where a lot of people have connected after so many years of not seeing each other. And so you find out that we are a platform that brings together already 1,750 participants who have at least attended one session. And that database is really important and interesting to us. And uh, one of our guests has been the Minister of Public Health, who's to promise that he's going to come back when we need him to answer very important questions. So it's really going to be a pleasure uh, to have this session. And of course, we have Dr. Mark Chofford. Mark, any words about the relevance of this topic? I'm just trying to feel the temperature in the house before we get to introduce our guest speaker for today. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for asking. I'm also very curious on this topic. And of course, you talked about connecting people. I'm seeing so many names here. People I knew back, back then, it's really exciting. And the first time I joined this forum was last week, or I say last two weeks. So I'm, I'm really curious to see what's uh, the situation in Cameroon. I'm very poised also, maybe in future, to contribute here positively. So thank you again. No, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mark, and we hope you will be with us and uh, certainly have an opportunity to tell us some uh, uh, key uh, health topics that could be of interest to you to educate the public and uh, to uh, also share your knowledge with other folks back home. Uh, this is a very interesting topic uh, we are going to have today, but uh, the, the speaker is, is a really an interesting uh, person, not just in medicine, but also you will hear that he's an entrepreneur uh, from his bio. And when we're thinking about how to introduce him, he said, okay, just say two things about me, what I do, and then talk about my business. All right, we're going to do just what you want us to do, because if we want to say who you are in entirety, it might take uh, some of your presentation time. So I hand over the opportunity to uh, Brian to, to present our guest before we dive into the presentation. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Elvis. I, I think uh, the like others have mentioned earlier, I think it's something that we haven't really talked about how important it is to protect the health of, of, of workers and and how that could lead to increased productivity and and you know reduced absences and things of that nature. So I'm really, really thrilled to to uh to introduce uh to have the honor of introducing Ekiti. And he's known Equity for, for many, many, many years. Uh, he has been a really great uh, model at the uh, Faculty of Medicine and, and Biomedical Sciences. He, he was the lead for uh, the, the, the CAMESA. Uh, he led uh, a, a very gigantic, uh, unforgotten uh, uh, health campaign at the time. 
and uh, has been such a great inspiration to younger uh, people within the Faculty of Medicine and, and, and Biomedical Sciences. And he's been one of those that we have uh, a lot of other young uh, medical students have really uh, looked up to because he's just uh, an example of what uh, hard work uh, connecting uh, with other uh, networking means and, and all that. So he's been such a really powerful uh, model. I have personally learned a lot from from uh, from Ikiti uh, uh, Martin, and I'm really thrilled that he um, he accepted the invitation to come today to to uh, to present on this very important uh, subject. Uh, Ikiti is a primary care physician. He's been uh, he's been a researcher and been an entrepreneur with a very keen interest in in the occupational medicine and has a very burning passion for. Uh, community health and, and welfare. And you'll notice that's been exemplified by his uh, continual commitment in the activities with the Kamesa where they do health campaigns and go into communities and try to provide health care to underserved areas and underserved people. And he's been a very committed part of that, uh, of that journey. He served as the chief of service for occupational medicine at the national oil refining company uh, sonara in cameroon uh, for over uh, where in over 6 years he contributed to the improvement of the health and productivity of over 650 uh, workers as well as provided uh, primary health care to a population of over uh, 3000 people this includes workers and families so uh, being involved in in uh, improving the health of the workers at sonara and also uh, their family members he's also the founder like elvis mentioned he's an entrepreneur so he's been the founder of a uh, and director of a company called a non-profit organization that he founded called gray lab uh, that has as primary goals to improve the health of workers particularly uh, in the community. And he's had a team of over 40 volunteers that have been helping him throughout the last five years to uh, really improve and screen thousands and thousands of workers from diseases that can be preventable, uh, uh, like community uh, commun non-communicable diseases and things of that nature through uh, lifestyle changes and interventions and uh, just improving health outcomes of people within the community. He's been an avid entrepreneur. He's been the managing director for another very important uh, company, I think, um, um, uh, called Ever Beauty. That's really been helpful in improving just cosmetic products for uh, for for skincare in Cameroon as well. So, uh, Ekiti Martin has been heavily involved. He's a physician, like I said. He's a researcher. He's uh, heavily in, uh, engaged in improving the health of of workers. He's also an entrepreneur. And I, one of the things I really love about him is how really how he's constantly thinking about how to uh, engage and how to improve uh, the health of uh, the health of people in the community, and I think his track record really shows that and exemplifies that uh, remarkably. So I'm really, really honored and thrilled, uh, Dr. Ekiti, to to have you. No, it's been a long time we haven't uh, connected, but I'm really, really thrilled, and we anxiously um, looking forward to your presentation today. Yeah, and, and Ekiti and I have a mutual friend, uh, Christelle, who is the founder of uh, Pierre Fokem Foundation. And when I had a meeting with them just to see how Unite for Health could uh, collaborate with them still on the mission of uh, providing access to healthcare in on the safe community, that was the name that came up. I say, Ekiti is the guy in Cameroon we're working with. Uh, he's doing a lot of work in the community, screening so many people, outreach campaigns. And of course, Ekiti, we're going to work together to continue to just provide these kind of services to the community. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, for if you are joining for the first time, we always have the presenter do the presentation while we uh, listen and maybe have some comments in the uh, in the chat room. Uh, at the end of his presentation, we shall have a question and answer session where you are free to uh, uh, ask your questions and get your answer from Ekiti. And at the end of the uh, entire session, those who can stay back uh, at the parking lot will be able to stay back. That's where we usually get to know each other and connect each other in a more informal uh, way. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining. The, this session of the Cameron Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals as we hand over the microphone to Ekiti for his presentation. Hi, hi everyone. I uh, just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Blended. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, share my screen, but while I'm yes. trying to sort that out, I want to say I'm extremely humbled to be here. 
I have followed a few sessions of the Cameroon Town Hall. <laughs> Frankly, I did not think that I was going to make it as a speaker on the Cameroon Town Hall for another five to 10 years, which has been my goal. So thank you for shortening my, 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 the time it took for me to achieve that goal. It's a, it's a real pleasure and a privilege for me to be here to share what little experience I've been able to gather over time when it comes to uh, occupational medicine and especially uh, how it relates to other aspects of our healthcare practice, because you know that um, we are all here. A lot of people have said different things about what the experience is with occupational medicine. And uh, it's really my goal today to see how we all are involved with occupational medicine and not just those who are actively practicing as occupational health physicians. So um, without much ado, we're going, to, um, we're going to go through the presentation. I'm hoping that it's not going to take more than 35 to 40 minutes. And hopefully, in the time that we're going to spend together, we're going to go through uh, the, following, the following aspects. We're going to introduce what occupational medicine is. We're going to talk about uh, occupational medicine in Cameroon. And then we're going to talk about if, we can do, if there's anything that we can do more as, as concerns occupational medicine in Cameroon. And also, I'm going to put it to you, what you the listener today can do as concerns occupational medicine. So first off, I want to start with this disclaimer just by saying that the views in this presentation are entirely mine and they don't represent um, formally or informally the positions of any of my employers past or present. So <clears throat> going through an introduction, we're going to talk about what is occupational medicine, who makes up the occupational medicine team and why the study and practice of occupational medicine is important. So according to McGraw and Hill, Dictionary of Scientific and Technical Terms, Occupational Medicine is a branch of medicine concerned with the maintenance of health in the workplace, including preventing and transmitting diseases and injuries that are related to the workplace, and which has a secondary objective to maintain and to increase productivity. This word is going to be very important throughout our presentation today, and also social adjustments in the workplace. So the occupational medicine team is made up of a number of people. So we have the occupational medicine physician or physicians. We have the occupational medicine nurses. We have occupational hygienists. And then the, these people outside of the clinic, if there's such, if there's such a place in the, in, the company where, in the company where you work, this, uh, this, this, this outside of the clinic, you have a whole team that is made up of uh, uh, staff representatives of a company, if you're an occupational medicine physician that works in a company, uh, HR managers, the Ministry of Labor is also represented, represented on that committee. And that committee is called, uh, this is an acronym in French, which stands for Comité d'Hygiène et Santé au Travail, or Comité d'Hygiène et Sécurité au Travail, depending on how, on, on where you are and, and, um, and, and, and what is practiced in your company. But if you work in a company, you're going to be part of what is called a Comité d'Hygiène et Sécurité au Travail, which is uh, the group that, that seeks to improve or to maintain occupational medicine in a company. Now, why do we even talk about occupational medicine? This is a, uh, an illustration or a graphic that is called from the Lancet, which shows that all of the importance pertaining to health and welfare in a society may be linked to uh, economic growth, but the two that are most directly linked are to in, uh, the ratio of workers to dependents and also increasing the labor productivity of one worker. So I leave it to you to decide which is easier to do in any country, to convince, especially us in Africa, to stop having many children so that you reduce the, the so that you increase the ratio of worker to dependence or to just improve the health of one of the individual worker. Now, in addition to that, more specifically, occupational medicine has contributed very greatly to economic growth in many different countries and has had economic impacts in many different countries. For instance, in low and middle income countries that contributed to 11% uh, of growth when it comes to uh, uh, economic growth, and that is directly linked to reductions in mortality. Secondly, uh, China, which is arguably one of, if not the current world superpower, owes a lot of its, of its economic boom to an increase in life expectancy. And leaving talk about death to something less morose, in the United States, which spends most on healthcare in the world compared to anywhere else, has experienced productive, productivity losses. That is what companies fail to gain because their workers called off sick. And this, the amount spent, on, the amount spent in, in productivity losses is consistently more than twice the combined spend on medical and pharmacy costs. So that's why occupational medicine is important in general. Now in Cameroon, after disclosing why 
occupational medicine is important in general, let's talk about occupational medicine in Cameroon. Most, if not all, of occupational medicine physicians that I know and who practice active occupational medicine have worked in some, in some capacity in occupational medicine before. Most of the doctors I have worked with in Sonora, if not all of them, did their thesis in occupational medicine. So it's basically a field that a lot of people don't hear about. We don't hear about it when we're in medical school. And even as practicing physicians, a lot, very few of us actually know what occupational medicine physicians do. And that has been confirmed in the beginning of this conversation where some of us have you know, shared our experience and a lot of people said that they have come to hear what it is all about. And another thing in my personal experience, a lot of my colleagues used to call me and find out exactly what I do. I know a lot of people think that we just sit in fancy offices in companies, especially those who work in companies and attend to a few patients a day and most importantly never have to worry about calls in general maybe because of that some of them have called me to ask me what they need to do so that they can be able to lead such a comfortable life first of all in Cameroon to practice occupational medicine you need to be a physician uh, you need to be an occupational medicine specialist but in the absence of occupational medicine specialists if you're a primary care physician like I am or a public health physician you can can practice occupational medicine. And the practice of occupational medicine takes place in two settings, basically. You have the accredited institutional occupational medicine services, like where I work, which is in Sonora. And you have uh, occupational medicine physicians or occupational medicine pract practitioners who work in independent occupational medicine practices or consultancy. So a lot of people who have private practices in Cameroon, you see a lot of them in Douala and in Yaoundé, they have aspects of their practice that have to do with occupational medicine. Now, some relevant texts and entities as pertaining to occupational medicine in Cameroon, you have decree number 79, bar 0096 of 1979, which talks about the modalities of practice of occupational medicine in Cameroon. You have the RT 31, which is like the Bible of occupational medicine practice, especially in the workplace. And then you have individual companies, collective agreements or company agreements, which is what, you know, um, uh, dictates what you can or cannot do as concerns of occupational medicine in the company. And then some entities, uh, social, National Social Insurance Fund, or which is more commonly known by its French acronym, CMPS, which is very active in occupational medicine, especially when it comes to um, uh, compensation for workplace or work-related injuries and work-related diseases. And then you have, of course, the Société Camerounaise de Sécurité et de Santo Travail, which is like the Société Savante of Occupational Medicine in Cameroon. So basically, the common tasks that are, um, that, that are incumbent on an occupational medicine physician are to carry out fit for work tests, which is a basically medical evaluation or physical evaluation and paraclinical as well of workers when they are being hired, when they're coming back to work after a long period of absence or at very different times, depending on what the motivation is. We also do health, re health risk evaluations and mitigations. So basically the risks in the workplace that are occupational or environmental. We also do routine medical visits, what is most commonly known in French as visit systematic or visit specific, depending on what sector you work in. And then we offer primary care to a target population. So depending on the company, you have some companies that offer primary care to just to workers. You have the companies that offer primary care to the workers and their families. And you also have companies that don't have occupational medicine services internally, but they refer their workers and their families to external uh, facilities like these consultancies I was talking about that offer primary care to this target population. And in addition to some of these uh, more common things that we know about, we also engage in what we call medical affairs and regulation. So this is what Muno was talking about. So um, working in occupational health, you have to be the liaison between the company and the health uh, healthcare practitioner. So for example, if a company has a worker that goes to the regional hospital of Limbe to consult, when they consult, the relationship between the company that is Sonara, for example, and regional hospital in Limbe is, is guaranteed or, 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 or followed up by the occupational medicine physician who is in charge of the medical affairs. That's where medical affairs comes in. So we are the liaison between our our, our entity, which is a company, and the healthcare provider that is providing this care. Also, we do a regulation. Basically, that means that if the regional hospital of Limbe, for example, offers services to our workers, and that is going to generate an invoice or a bill. When that bill comes, it's up, it's up to us to determine whether uh, what was billed is actually what was done, and whether what was billed was in line with um, 
the diagnosis that was posed, were they, did they, did they bill more than they should have? Did they ask for more tests than were necessary to diagnose and treat simple malaria and things like that? And then also you have audits, which is basically when people go outside of this network of healthcare providers that the company offers, and then they have access to uh, uh, healthcare, healthcare services. For example, if we, ha if we offer healthcare providers only in Limbe or in Douala, and then you're in Bamenda for one reason or another, and then you go to a hospital and you're treated. When you bring the bills or the receipts and ask to be reimbursed by the company, it's up to the occupational medicine physician or occupational medicine team to evaluate whether the, your claim is valid and whether you're reimbursed or not. And then we are also very much involved and engaged in health promotion, whether it be in the workplace, in the families of our workers or in general. So basically, in a nutshell, that's what we do in Cameroon as concerns occupational medicine. But now my question is, is there anything that we can do more? Now, they're here, we're going to talk about what occupational medicine looks like in other parts of the world, um, what other people are saying about occupational medicine in other parts of the world, and if there's anything that we can do, that we can learn from those experiences uh, and from that information to be able to improve occupational medicine in the work in Cameroon, as, as specifically as pertains to health and wellness, in the workplace. So I'm going to be highlighting three particular conditions or three groups of conditions. Uh, uh, it's very easy, for example, as occupational medicine physicians to visualize or focus on workplace injuries uh, as opposed to work-related diseases. Anybody who has worked in occupational health knows that it's very easy to say that, okay, this person was doing this task. For example, he was, he's a carpenter and he was working and in swinging his hammer, he hurt his finger. And because he was working when he was swinging his hammer, it's a work-related injury, right? It's very easy to visualize that and to focus on that because it's very objective. But now there's another part of it which concerns the occupational uh, or the work-related diseases, which are, for example, saying that someone, because by virtue of the fact that this person works in this particular company or in this particular industry, he's exposed to silica or is exposed to lead or is exposed to benzene, for example, which is more rife in the industry where I where I have worked, and it's very it's, it's, it's a lot less less straightforward to say that if this person has inhaled benzene over time, or if this person has exposed to silica over time, he's going to be his, this this uh, anemia or this uh, leukemia or this lymphoma that he develops is directly or indirectly linked, or is as a result of his work in this area. So it's because it's an area that is more subjective a lot of occupational medicine practitioners tend to shy away from this. And um, you'll see that in our, in, if you go through the records of CMPS, you'll see that a lot of the, of the compensation that CMPS gives is for workplace injuries and not workplace diseases. Now enough said about that particular thing. The point I was trying to make is that um, if you go through research, the WHO and the International Labor Organization say that chronic disease accounts for 80% of work-related deaths. So I've just talked about two things, work-related injuries and work-related deaths. So according to WHO and ILO, up to 80% of these deaths are directly linked to chronic disease and not chronic injury and not work-related injuries. And also, of, uh, aside from this 80%, 71% of the uh, DALIs. DALIs are basically um, disability adjusted life years. So it's not death per se, but it's the number of years that are lost because you have a disability or you have a disease or you, you die prematurely. 71% of DALIs in total in the world are attributed to work-related diseases as opposed to work-related injuries. So the focus is tends to be on work-related injuries, but they're the minority of the burden of work-related conditions the world over. And over 50% of this, these conditions that are being referred to here are cardiovascular and their related conditions. Now, that's talking about death. If we want to talk about uh, other just disability in general, up to a third of the world, or in some countries, you can, you can even go up to 50%, up to a third of the world has musculoskeletal disorders. And low back pain, especially, has been the leading cause of disability the world over since 1990 to date. And the third category of um, conditions that we're going to be talking about today is mental health conditions. So research, research from the WHO and also the ILO states that 12 billion working days are lost every year 
to absenteeism and presenteeism. So these are two very important terms in occupational medicine. Absenteeism is the act of being absent from work, right? Presenteeism is the act of being at work, but not being productive because you are not 100%, because you are ill or because uh, for some reason you are not concentrated and you cannot focus and you're not productive. So that is presenteeism. You're physically present, but you're not being productive. Whereas absenteeism is being absent from work. And in total, every year, the world loses, or companies in the world lose 12 billion working days to these two conditions. And in the US, or for example, in the world, $1 trillion is lost in, it represents productivity losses in the world when it comes to mental health or absenteeism and presenteeism. And so that just tells you that these three conditions, so these three groups of conditions are very, very important. And we're going to be talking about what the situation about, what the situation is in the world and in Cameroon especially, and what we can do to improve on this. So let me share a little story about uh, that can shed some light on the importance of occupational medicine. So when I was in medical school, actually in the sixth year of medical school, when we were done with uh, evaluations and everything, I was thinking about what to do for my thesis. And because one of my mentors, actually my mentor is, uh, is, is, is a nephrologist, I was almost 100% sure I was going to do a thesis in nephrology. So I was going through research in the world to figure out what I can do as my research topic for the final year of medical school. And I found out that 13.4% was a global prevalence of CKD. And in Cameroon, studies have shown that this prevalence can range from 109 to 14.1%. And then in reading through, I realized that there are some areas in the world where the prevalence of CKD can go up to 50%. And that was shown in some sugarcane plantation, sugarcane plantations, especially in Central and South America. So uh together you know filled with this information i decided i was going to do a study or do research in this particular field and together with my with with, uh, with my mentor and the team that she was working with at the time they found that the prevalence of ckd in smallholder cocoa farmers so this is very important smallholder cocoa farmers are the cocoa farmers in konye konye is in kumba or around kumba so the cocoa farmers there that are not in any company they're just smallholders who have their farms and then they go out to farm. And we found out 16.2% of the group that worked on it found that 16.2% had CKD attributed to many different causes. And then, you know, I, the study that I did or that I worked in was to evaluate the same prevalence of CKD, the same CKD in the sugarcane plantation in Cameroon. So we have only one sugarcane plantation in Cameroon, and that is in the Susikam run plantations in Cameroon, which are in Banjok and Kuteng. And that's why I worked all, of, all through my seventh year of medical school to evaluate the prevalence and the factors associated. And we found that the prevalence of CKD was only 3.4%, so much lower than the global prevalence, much lower than even the prevalence in Cameroon. And when we're, when I, when we're going through the study and trying to figure out why that was, we found out two things. Firstly, the workers in Banjok and in Kuteng go to the farm very early in the morning. So by four o'clock in the morning, they're off and they're in the farm and they're working. And before the sun gets up, you know, at 11, 12, they're done at the farm and then they come back. And secondly, something very important that we found out was that at various intervals in the farm, you had water tanks like this one, where you have, for example, this is a picture I took in 2016 or 2015. Um, this is, a, this is a worker that has access to clean water that they can drink throughout the time when they're in the farm. And these two things, the fact that they went in early and the fact that they had water available to them is what we believe contributed to the, you know, the low prevalence of CKD in this population compared to the general population and compared to another worker population without organized occupational medicine. And this was a strategy and a policy that was put in place because in Susikam they have a very well-structured um, occupational medicine service or uh, division that was put together under which I worked during my time here. So this just underlines or underscores the importance of occupational medicine in general when it comes to preventing disease and increasing uh, or improving or optimizing productivity of workers in general. Now, working from home is a new norm since, since COVID and we are all very happy and thrilled about it, the ability to be able to sit like this and have professional meetings from the comfort of our homes. It presents a massive opportunity to employers However, the cost of, because the cost of equipping workers with laptops and remote gear to, to, to access the internet and working tools is only a fraction of the cost involved in setting up an entire office and paying for people to come in 
to the office and to go back paying for uh, occupational health and safety policies and standards to be set up in that place, paying for insurance to cover any incidents that take place in the workplace and on the on on the on the on the on the way to and from work. Those are all responsibilities that the company normally has. But now with work from home, you know, you just give your laptop, you give you access to internet, and everything is online. Everything is on the cloud, and from the comfort of everybody's home. Uh, we tend to do a lot of the work that we used to do in offices before. However, it's very important to ask ourselves the question, whose job is it to ensure that this work that we're doing from home is safe? The workplace that we have established for ourselves is, is safe. I don't know in, in the developed world, those of you who are active in the developed world, I don't know if before you're set up for home offices, whether someone comes by your home to evaluate whether you have the right lighting, whether you have the right ergonomy when it comes to your table, your chair, you know, things like that. Those are all things that we do in occupational medicine in a, in a, in a, in a standard occupational medicine setting. But is, are those same things being done in the, in, in, in the work from home culture that we have adopted today? And so see this gentleman, he's, you know, he's having his meeting, he's smiling. But the truth is, if he does this consistently over time, he's going to develop low back pain. We all know that because if we know that if he takes this position every day for long periods of time, he's going to develop low back pain. Now, there is a, we used to have a running joke in the medical service of Sonora about our place in the company. So let's take a look at this illustration. So you have this gentleman that is, you know, struggling to stay safe and to stay balanced between these two between these two cliffs. And who, what do these two cliffs represent? So in the first cliff, you have an employer. The employer always wants you to work, irrespective of what the situation is. If the employer has his way, you're going to come to the office Monday to Sunday, morning to evening, and you're going to be doing work. And on the other hand, you have workers. Most workers, especially in Cameroon, where I have worked, just want to lounge, just want to chill, just want to have fun, but they want to get paid for it, right? And... Also, in the middle there, the gentleman that's trying to balance between the two cliffs is the occupational medicine physician or the occupational medicine team. So you have the employer that thinks that you're friends with the worker because the worker has time off from you. You have workers that think you hate them. You only want them to work as work slaves because you're refusing to give them time off and cons consistently balance between the employer and the employee, trying to figure out how to not give too many days off and how to, uh, you know, not work not, not cause workers to work to the, at the detriment of their health. But why is this situation in Cameroon or where is where I've worked? Why is this situation in most companies? It's because people are not, you know, comfortable or people are not happy coming to work. And why do people, why are people not happy coming to work? People endure their work as opposed to enjoying their work. And it's because, in my opinion, it's because you don't pay as much importance or, or as much attention to mental health in the workplace as we pay to other aspects of work health. So let's, this is a wake up call to occupational medicine physicians, to occupational medicine practitioners to think about mental health in the workplace. So if you know this lady, she's a therapist in a show called Billions and she's responsible, she was, you know, she's as a therapist, she was responsible to make sure that the workers there are ready to go out for the company and to kill every time that they are there. So if you watch the show, you understand what she does and why it's important for mental health to be looked after in the workplace. Now, that after that was, you know, in the past section, we've been talking about what we can do more, but now what can you do? You know, you who is listening to me, you who is watching this presentation, you who is listening to this presentation, what can you do? How can you get involved? Are you, are you just a spectator? Are you, uh, someone who is an actor? Are you someone who has a, an active part to play or just a passive part to play? First of all, if you're someone who is active in occupational medicine in companies, this is now this is for company-based occupational medicine practitioners, one of the things you can do is objectively track health-related productivity losses. So if you go back to the slide where I was talking about the research that was done, most of this research that was referred to by WHO and the ILO were based on systematic reviews. And... Um, you, you know, those of you who know what systematic reviews, I'll refer you to Dr. Kate or Dr. Ndip. Those are people who know a lot about systematic reviews. But what I noticed in going through this research is that none of the studies that were referred to, there was not one study in occupational medicine that was from Cameroon. Now, I didn't see any from Africa. Maybe I just didn't look enough, but that just tells you that there is a lot, a lot, a lot that still needs to be done when it comes to 
us actually tracking productivity losses or looking out for occupational medicine in our context. These are things that can be done. If you look at the research that was done in other countries, there are things that are replicable in Cameroon and it's something that we can do. Now, because if you're in a company, there's usually this um, uh, uh, limits to what you can do and say about the practices that are in that particular company. I'll just recommend that those who are in the companies should track health-related productivity losses in their particular company. Now, if you track these, you'll, you'll find out the reasons why people are absent from work and the reasons why people are present but not being productive. And when you find that out, you can develop relevant disease prevention programs, both preventive and curative, to make sure that people, when they are present, they are more productive and to reduce lost time to illness and injury in the company. And another thing you can do is to create mental health units in your company if these don't already exist. One thing I noticed, for example, in Sonora over the past uh, few years since the fire incident, I don't know if any of you knew about the fire incident that took place in Sonora. There was a, I saw a lot of people that were depressed. I saw a lot of people that were just anhedonic. That is, they have no energy. They lost their energy. They lost their oomph to come to work. And this is things that I was seeing just because I'm a healthcare practitioner, but it was not, you know, we didn't have any systems that were set up at the time to be able to cater to some of these things. These are things that you as an occupational medicine practitioner can set up in your company so that you can cater to the mental health, which is very, 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 very important to the productivity of workers in general. And then after you've found out all of these, you can develop target approaches to improve the health outcomes of your workers and also improve the productivity. Now, in most companies, um, the occupational medicine position is a specialist, is a professional, is someone who is the only one in the company that has that expertise. So if he sets himself up right, he would have the listening ear of the employer. So if you have this listening ear of your employer, please use it. But the only way in my experience that I found to cause the employer or to motivate the employer to make the changes that you're asking them to do it is to present them with data. So one of the things I did most uh, very, very commonly in my practice was that I always use data. If, I, if I'm coming to tell you, okay, I think that we need to not send people to see the gastroenterologist for the hepatitis treatments. I think that we should bring the people here I think that we should order the medications or the ARV so that they can come and get from us here instead of sending them out. But to do that, to convince the employer to buy one year's work or six months work of, uh, worth of antiretrovirals to have, now when I say antiretrovirals, not for HIV, but for hepatitis. So the tenofovirs, the Wimleys, you know, all of that that is used for hepatitis B especially. I, I was able to convince the company to buy six months worth of stock to be able to have it in the company so that our workers will not go out to see the gastroenterologist to collect that treatment. And the only way I was able to convince them to do that or to fork out that money beforehand is I was able to show them that over the past year, we had lost X and Y number of days per X and num uh, you know, Z number of workers. So Z number of workers lost X, X and Y number of days that they should have come to work because they had to go to Douala, because we don't have any gastroenterologists in Limbe, they had to go to Douala and spend the entire day in Douala to collect just their medication. These are things that we can, if we have here, we can dispense to them. And instead of spend losing a whole day, they can lose half an hour to come to our office. We talk to them, we counsel them, we give them medication and they're off. You know, so if you can, if you're able to collect data like this, I believe that you'll be able to convince your employer to be able to make some of these changes and drive these policies in your companies. Now, if you're not in a company, but you're part of a private practice or a consultant that, you know, caters to the occupational medicine um, 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 demands or the needs of a company or several companies. And one thing that you can do, because you're removed from the company, I don't have that conflict of interest. Now, these are, I think that you are the ones who can intentionally collect work-related data, work-related health data, and engage in independent clinical research that cuts across various industries. Because, for example, all the research or all the data I collected was only in the oil and gas industry, or in the, or it's not even the oil, entire oil and gas, it's just in the downstream oil and gas, so just in refinery. However, if I was part of a consultancy or you who is part of a consultancy, because as part of your occupational medicine consultancy, you receive workers from banks, you receive workers from industries, you receive workers from filling stations, you receive workers from agricultural companies, only you have the access, have access to the data that is needed to engage in independent clinical research across different industries. And with this data, with this research that you can carry out, we can drive not only 
uh, local policies in our companies and in our regions, but also national policies. And why not international policies in Africa where no such data is currently available? And you who is listening to me and you're just a student or you think that you're not yet qualified to be an occupational medicine physician, what can you do? Now, you can volunteer at an occupational medicine facility, whether it be in a company or it be in a consultancy or a practice, and engage the practice so that at the end of when you graduate, you'll not be like some of us or some of our colleagues who have never heard about occupational medicine and don't know what it's about. You engage the practice and you evaluate your interests. Now, interestingly, occupational medicine in the US, for example, where there's a lot of research, a lot of data that's available, is being ranked as one of the highest specialties in medicine where or one of the specialties in medicine with the least prevalence or incidence of burnout. So occupational medicine physicians in the US uh, uh, um, uh, exhibit the, one of the highest or some of the highest levels of work-life balance or comfort or happiness in the workplace. So as a student, maybe you want to engage with occupational medicine practice and see whether it's something for you or whether it's something that you can be you can potentially be interested in. Another thing you can do is to engage in occupational medicine research. I mean, there's so much, like I said, the, there's no data that I found. I may be wrong, but there's no data or very little data in Cameroon, especially in Africa in general, uh, that, that has been done on occupational medicine. And these are things that you can do very easily. So you can, you, know, you can initiate yourselves in novel and very high yield, yet affordable occupational health data collection. These are things that can be done easily. So if you want to, just off the top of my hat, you know, you can evaluate the burnout or the, the prevalence of burnout syndrome in healthcare practitioners in Yaoundé, in Boya, in Bamenda. As a student, this is something that you can do very easily. All you need is a questionnaire and you can go into CSU or you can go into Hospital General, or you can go into Fondation Chantal Bia, or you can go into the regional hospital in Boya, or wherever it is you are, and talk to the healthcare practitioners that you can come in contact with, and fill the questionnaire. At the end, you collect your questionnaires. You have not spent any money. You're already doing rotations in these in this places, so you're not going out of your way to collect this data, and you can engage in collecting some of this data that can even put out the paper to talk about the burnout or the prevalence of burnout in healthcare practitioners. That's just one example. Another example that comes to mind, which is a little on the funny side. I remember in our days in um, doing rotations in, uh, in, in hospitals in Yaoundé, the sleeping conditions were of, of students were just out of this world. I remember in Seashu, we used to, there was our core room in Medicine and Ten had one bed and had one table with about three chairs. And you have like seven people on call. So fourth years, fifth years, sixth years, uh, you have seven people on call and everybody has to spend the night in this room. So why, don't in, why not evaluate the impact of sleeping conditions on medical student performance in rotations? You know, it's a funny thing to think about, but it's one thing that you can easily do you know, as a student and you can have, you can collect really um, high yield data. And you know, if you're worried about, or if you're wondering how you can use this data to, 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 to hone your, your, your skills and to improve your research toolkit. Again, I refer you to specialists that we have in this, in, this, in this forum, in this town hall, on how you can put some of this, how you can develop some of these um, competencies to improve your data collection skills and your research skills in general. And if you're in none of these categories, you're neither a student, you're not an occupational medicine physician, you're not, an occupation, you're not a physician that in their practice sees workers, what can you do? There's so much that you can do, right? So in your community, whether it be around your, your house, whether it be in your church, whether it be in your local community, your Jangi group, I'm sure that there are workers there. And there's a lot that you can do in that particular setting to look out for the health of the workers. Just as a healthcare professional, you know, you can, you can look out for the health of workers in those different parts of your, of your daily life. And especially those in the informal sector, because a lot of what we've spoken about so far has to do with people who are in the formal sector, people who are employed. So people who have either employers or, 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 or other people that are looking out for their health. But how about the bike drivers? How about the taxi drivers? How about the smallholder farmers? Who's looking out for their health? You as a healthcare professional in your community, in your cafe, in your village, there's a lot that you can do to improve on the health of workers, especially those in the informal sector. You can engage in early detection of debilitating diseases or conditions that have an impact on the productivity of these people. You can develop scalable interventions to improve their health outcomes. You know, you can simply tell them that, okay, I see that when you go to the farm, 
these are uh, these are the, these are the tools that you're using. You know, your hoe is too short, so you have to bend lower. And because you bend lower, you know, you you you're more exposed to low back pain. How about you use this kind of uh, agricultural tool or this other kind of agricultural tool? Just some of these things that we tend to undermine, but that are very very important when it comes to work related diseases, work related injuries, and um, productivity of workers in general. And also, we can help to boost worker productivity. You know, if we if we can just engage in some of these very easy things to do in the community, we can help to boost worker productivity. And hopefully at, with all of this put together, we can contribute to sustainable economic growth in our country. Now, with the, um, with the help, with the permission of the moderators, you know, let me talk to you in a few minutes about how you can, how you can, you know, how you can contribute to making a difference in the community if you don't identify with any of the prior groups that we have, uh, we have, we have spoken about, and just tell you a little bit about what the Gray Lab does. So the Gray Lab is, uh, you know, it's a not-for-profit not health-related research organization, which has as vision to see a healthy worker population with increased productivity that can contribute to sustainable economic growth. And our objectives are to promote the culture of prevention and early detection of debilitating diseases, which can affect productivity of workers, facilitate interventions to prevent the spread and to slow down the progression of these conditions and to encourage occupational practices aimed at improving productivity. And how do we do this? We do this by uh, employing a three-pronged approach, which focuses on one sensitization. So we use various means of sensitization, mass sensitization, where we use the TV, tabloids, that is newspapers and the like, radio, mobile caravans, churches. In some of the previous pictures, you saw some of our volunteers talking on pulpits. We use village squares, town criers via the chief sports walk to in inform the population about the different things that we want to inform them about, especially as pertains to their health and how it impacts their productivity. Uh, we do we use out of home methods as well. We use billboards, crossroad banners, and social media in, 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 you know, in general, you know, to be more specific, Facebook and LinkedIn, using paid and organic uh, posts to talk about what we do and how we can improve the health of workers in general. And after sensitization, we engage in early detection. So. One of the things I enjoyed the most about my time in, in, in medical school and in Kamesa, even after medical school, is doing health campaigns. So being part of a team that would go into a community, organize screening for, for, for conditions that you can screen for. We use basically, uh, uh, you know, calling call from this, this experience that we had or that I had particularly from health campaigns with Kamesa and even outside of Kamesa. So we use point of care devices, diagnostic devices, which is one of the things that Elvis was, I'm sure Elvis, you heard Crystal talk about, uh, to screen the population for certain conditions that can have an impact on their productivity. And when we screen the, the people, we don't just leave them you know, with the results like that. So we do we organize mobile clinics as well, during which we have doctors who are there to attend to the primary care needs of this population that we have screened. Uh, séance tenante, as they say in French. And after that, we, you know, implement interventions. And basically, these interventions are referrals, where all the cases after the primary consultation that need special specialist care are referred to our partner specialists. So far, we have partnerships in cardiology and nephrology, which are the areas that we have worked the most in, and also ophthalmology. And we refer these people that have uh, problems with their results to these specialists that can attend to their more specific needs. And also we engage in interventions that have to do with lifestyle modifications. So we do, we enroll select participants that meet several or that meet certain well-defined criteria into targeted diet and physical exercise schedules. And in the pictures that we, that we saw before, we saw some physical education activities that were going on as part of our activities of the Grey Lab. So here also we have some, you know, some examples. This is a sensitization campaign that we did with the taxi drivers in, in Limbe. This is a press conference that we organized to talk about uh, health in the, in the in the importance of physical activity to health. These are some of our billboards, you know, banners that we have put up. This is a training session that we we had with some of our partners to to use the point of care devices that we got. This is us, some of our volunteers doing the screening in the community, and this is part of what we do as a Grey Lab to build a population of healthy workers so that we can have an imagination to tomorrow. So in just some key elements of the work that we've done so far, so we have over 40 well-trained and highly motivated volunteers who are both medical, paramedical, and even non-medically inclined. And we all together engage in collaborative work 
And also as an organization, we are the first in Central and West Africa that is capable of screening for kidney disease in the community. And basically this is one thing that I was very, very um, particular about and intentional about because as someone who did, who did a study that evaluated prevalence of CKD in, a, in the community, I remembered how difficult it was to see these people before they went out to the farm in the morning, collect their blood samples, centrifuge the blood, take it to the lab, run the analysis on the, on the biochemistry analyzer that we had in the lab at the moment. It took me several hours to go from start to finish to be able to, to come up with these serum creatinine uh, values and estimated GFRs. But with, through a partnership with uh, Nova Biomedical, uh, and for some peer for chem, we're able to have some of some devices, our point of care devices that on, in under 30 seconds, give us some of these results of sodium creatinine and EGFR. So we'll put that together with other tools that we have to screen over 2,500 people in the past few years for hypertension, diabetes, obesity, kidney disease, cataracts, retinopathies, and these are some of the partners that we've worked with so far to, to do this. And now talking about some of these partners, how do we relate with these people? So there are three groups of people that interact with us in the Grey Lab, right? So you have the beneficiaries of our activities. So these are the people that make up the audience of our sensor campaigns and just you know in 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 brackets or in quotes the sensation can be on anything so last two weeks we we're talking about cancer for example if you want to talk to the population about cancer how do you go about it it has always been a burden of mind that those who do traditional medicine not traditional medicine you know no pun intended but those who do uh phytotherapy uh, in our community, especially in Cameroon, are more out there. So you, it's, it's more likely that you see a billboard about a potion that cures 25 diseases than it is that you see a billboard about chronic kidney disease or about um, uh, diabetes, for example. So we know that the billboards in Cameroon that talk about malaria, the billboards in Camila talk about HIV, and these are uh, intentional activities that are run by organizations to inform the population about particular health conditions. So why not spread the word? Why not spread the net? Why not do more? So we can, you know, we are able to leverage some of these uh, market or communication tools that we have already been able to have experience with, you know, I spoke about some of them earlier, be it the media, be it out of home, be it social media, be it um, uh, mass communication strategies that we have already used to talk about any topic, whether it's cancer. So if you are an organization, for example, that wants to talk about, that wants to inform the public, public about something, you know, and you're worried how to pass that information, this is something that, uh, you know, we can help you with. And then we also... You know, the other beneficiaries are those who we screen in our, in our campaigns. It's worthy of note that everything that we do in the Green Lab is free of charge for the beneficiaries. And even the enrollments and in our intervention programs is also free of charge. And also you have the general public that is the consumer of all the content that we put out across our different platforms. And we have the scientific community that is looking to scale our models. And on the, lastly, we have our partners who are like philanthropic organizations or companies that are engaged in corporate social responsibility who are willing but are not able or they don't have the expertise to carry out health-related outreaches. Uh, so we represent them or we are like their, their, their legs on the ground. And then also researchers who need work done in the community but they don't have the trained expertise or manpower to carry out these community-based researches or research projects. These are also things that we can, we can, we can help you with. So... Thank you very much for your keen and kind attention. If you have any questions, uh, I'm going to be in the comment section and I'm also going to be ready in the next part of our presentation or in the next part of our town hall meeting to respond to these questions. If you want to get to me, these are some of the channels that you can get to me on. I am usually most active on LinkedIn, but you can send me an email and uh, LinkedIn and email are where uh, you you probably get to me easiest, but then you can also send me a message on Facebook, and I'll get to get it, get it eventually. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and uh, over to you, moderators. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kitty. This has been a really really interesting uh, presentation. Thanks so much for putting this together. You can stop sharing your screen so we can interact with uh, the audience. This is really great. As you. We're presenting, and uh, a lot of things came to my mind. And I'm sure, uh, Brian, you will you, you you're going to com uh, comment on this. Maybe uh, can you please stop sharing your screen? 
just so, trying to figure um, out. Are so, you the one who started the yeah. sharing? Yes. Okay. Still All right. There. You're still there? I know this is this is Mono's screen now. Okay, Mono, maybe you stop sharing your screen. Oh, great. I like to see and get the interaction. Brian, you agree that he made a clarion call for medical students who are interested to be um, occupational uh, uh, physicians to, to, to just gain uh, opportunity to intern in some of these corporations, but also just see how they can even do their thesis on some very important topics he cited, like just going to the hospital and screening for burnout. Something came to my mind, a very interesting topic. Christel Vupove, Pale de Sa. A student can also just go beside the Ministry of Finance down there and evaluate the impact of drinking alcohol during break time and how it relates to work attitude. Because in every ministry, um, you find a small little bar where at 12 or 12.30 people go for break and they drink and eat very well and drink like two or three bottles of beer before getting back to the office. And uh, the government is one of the highest employer uh, in Cameroon in terms of workforce, uh, I think seconded by CDC. So the first person to actually cater for the uh, health of its workers is the government. And uh, if we have this phenomenon of uh, drinking alcohol a lot during break time, I think that's a very interesting topic that somebody can pick up and tell us just how that impact rudeness and reception in those ministries. Uh, Christelle, is que, can you understand this? Or maybe I'm out of topic. <laughs> no, 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 pas du tout. Je crois que, merci beaucoup, Dr. Ekiti, c'était tellement digeste. Et vous voyez, euh, ça suscite beaucoup d'attention, beaucoup d'idées. Voilà, Elvis qui propose déjà des idées de recherche dans le, au ministère des Finances, l'alcool. Je crois que c'est évident, ça, va, ça vaut le coup parce qu'avec l'étude que vous avez fait à Sociocam, qui montre que des simples gestes peuvent améliorer la condition des gens. Donc, je crois aussi que ça, ça ouvre le champ large à plusieurs études, pas de, la, pas de grande envergure, mais des petites données, des petites analyses qui permettent d'avoir de, des petites solutions qui permettent d'améliorer le les conditions de vie des employés. Donc, définitivement, c'est une très bonne idée, Elvis. Je crois que quelqu'un voudrait bien, voudrait bien s'engager à le faire. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Christelle. And, and Brian, this song caught my attention when he spoke about uh, mental health. I realized just how much um, a lot of people, as he said, are enduring their job, not enjoying it. And uh, a lot of people have had, you know, their workers go for mental health treatment and still come back to work without anybody, you know, bothering to know whether... They are, the cause of their mental health could be you know, you know, work-related circumstances or just the work environment. Brian, how, what, do you think the work environment in Cameroon can really be a great source of mental health problems? And do people really care? Brian, your yeah, comments first, uh, on the presentation. Yeah, yeah, first, I, I think that uh, um, that was a really excellent, excellent presentation. I was struck by the by the data you presented, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Kitty. I, I, th this was really, really uh, amazing. And it brought a lot of questions to my mind um, about the, 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 I know here in the United States, we have OCHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration uh, organization that really cut us to ensure uh, that, that, you know, worker safety and mental health and, and things like that. But I don't know if in Cameroon we have uh, uh, such, a, such a model and it would be really interesting if there are similar kind of, uh, there are successful models that I think Cameroon can learn from and potentially implement um, in so so as to enhance and, and really improve uh, the, the productivity of workers. I don't know if such a framework um, uh, exists in, in Cameroon. I, I think Canada has a similar model. I think um, Australia might have a similar workplace model, um, but it would be great if there are some um, uh, ideas and some programs that uh, Dr. Ekiti thinks the, the, the Cameroon government can potentially implement to uh, to enhance uh, the, the the productivity and the, the wellness of workers uh, workers themselves. Um, I think we've we've had a very good uh, um, implementation of that in some in some places, but I think there are still lots of gaps in in, in other areas as well. So this was really uh, really great. I was intrigued by the numbers he presented, the the figure he presented on the CKD numbers in Sosukam, the and how uh, and the high prevalence of CKD in the workers in the in the cocoa farm. I I was just amazed at what a difference just the availability of portable water made um, in that uh, very particular community. 
So uh, kudos to you, uh, Dr. Ikitsi. I really, really enjoyed the presentation. Yeah, I I did as well, Brian. It's really it was really a great presentation. While we are allowing Martin to uh, get a cup uh, a cup of water, we are just trying to get some reaction to the presentation before we we'll hand over to Christelle to manage the question and answer session. Uh, let's get to the chair, Muno. What was your take about the presentation? Wow, I think as you all, I made a comment that the presentation was extremely informative and extremely good. It made me ponder about a lot of things. Because the, as you said, the biggest employer in Cameroon is actually the government. But what has the government done to its workers apart from parastatus? I worked with the government in Cameroon. Did the government ever really care about the state of healthcare workers? Did they actually ask us about our vaccination before starting working in hospitals? Was the prevalence of hepatitis B and C in our hospitals? It's catastrophic if I tell you that. Go test healthcare workers. Those who are medical students here, go try it. I, um, I, it gets me really to ponder that the government may be wanting all the parastators and all those who come to Cameroon to practice occupational health in their industries Why the government is not doing it. In no place is it doing it among its workers. We all, even as healthcare workers at risk of studying and getting hepatitis in the hospital, getting B, C, getting other infections in the hospital, nobody obliges us to get vaccinated. Nobody provides these vaccines for us. This, this really made me to go back and start thinking the time I was working for the government and what research data can be done in order to really move things forward because I'm just targeting the highest employer in Cameroon, really. And maybe I'm putting the highest employer on the spot, but this is really an important topic that needs to be discussed. And uh, I would ask any gastroenterologists, we had those who have important data in Africa and in Cameroon in particular, especially concerning hepatitis and the prevalence in Cameroon hepatitis B in hospitals among healthcare workers and other diseases that can actually be mitigated, not necessarily related to accidents as Kitty put it. So to me, I've learned a lot, as I told you, I came here to learn. And uh, it's really the, everyone is talking about this. So this it was a so so camp research that he, he talked about. It's something that really brings to light the importance of sharing data, the importance of how little things can actually have big impacts. Impact. Because the impact of taking care of patients with CKD, we all know in the world is astronomers. It's one of the only diseases that is put in. Once you have CKD, you, have, you qualify for Medicare in America. You know, if you know what that is, you qualify automatically. We've asked ourselves as an internist, I asked myself, why do other diseases not qualify? You just qualify automatically, you can get dialysis, no matter your age. The rest of the time, you need to be 65 years and above. Maybe I know a lot of people don't know that. Even if you're two years old and you are on hemodialysis, you, you get all the benefits. So this is just telling you exactly how much you can reduce the burden of disease by taking into account certain little things that, I mean, New York City, we do evaluate for 9-11, uh, for we screen for 9-11 exposure to every patient that comes to our office and try to get, because there's so much money that has been put aside for them and uh, most of them don't even know about it. As primary care doctors, if you're working, I no longer work in the primary care sector, but occupational medicine is really an important field and uh, we cannot really minimize the aspect of, uh, of uh, mental health. And one other important question he asked, which we're going to talk about, who is going to take responsibility if I'm working from home and I hurt my back? I, I really, that was a nice question. I've never thought about it. Who is going to, but I think as uh, physicians, myself, I don't really work from home and I'm jealous about it all the time. So I'll be over. <laughs> Yes, uh, you said it. Who is going to take responsibility? And I'll bring uh, Dr. Uh, Figures and Bay. Maybe you can get your, I can get your thoughts on this. He also said that uh, CNPS will mostly pay for uh, work-related injuries and not work-related diseases. And this is true because then if you, uh, uh, Muno just talk about hitting your back, we are looking at only the physical, the injury. What about the disease aspect of it? What about these Hisakam workers that are moving in the morning without gloves, picking dirts and working for Hisakam? Who actually cares for occupational health disease? Uh, uh, Dr. Fergus, and there's some thoughts about this. In fact, Dr. Martin, uh, that is very uh, an elegant presentation, if I may use that borrowed word. 
thank you so much. And thank you for your simplicity in research to advance medicine, it's, it's, it's beautiful. In fact, um, I may want to start by, um, you know, looking at what's happening at the level of our workers in the government, since that was a topic we're talking about in the reactions. Um, the, the people in the government, they need help. We usually think that the people who are up there have the solutions for us. These discussions we are discussing like this, that's what they need because they, they, they are all stressed up. If you, if you look at the average lifespan of an administrator in Cameroon, you find that it doesn't plateau, but it dwindles. So um, they, need, they need good ideas. And some of those good ideas like he has given are not only applicable in the hospital, but what about even the women who give birth to children? What kind of stress do they go through? Um, is it possible that we can introduce, uh, we can introduce um, what we used to have in, in the past? The, um, what do you call it? Um, we, we could introduce- um, Maternal health leave? Nursery, nursery facilities, okay. nursery facilities. And we can actually get companies, including the hospital to manage those facilities. Uh, what of if as an occupational medical doctor, you can um, lend your services and say, if any company from Sonara to other companies want to open a nursery facility, which would take into account all the little uh, newborn babies for easy breastfeeding to get those mothers from their homes and the long maternity leaves to shorten down. So those children can actually come to us, you know, they, they can be taken care of while the women are putting their efforts into what they do, that is something that can also reduce great stress amongst our women folk. Um, it's coming abroad that we realize that there's, there's a lot of substance we are losing back because we are, we are hindering the women from, you know, from advancing through some of those things. It's not just taking care of the husbands, taking care of the family, but it's also having these long maternity leaves and, and a lot of disadvantages. So uh, that was one aspect I really wanted to bring up, uh, you know, to contribute to this. And then uh, probably lastly, um, it's the fact that this, uh, it, is, it is, if you look at how healthy, even with the little pay conditions can be out there, there is more stress here in the United States or in other, uh, I know we have medical doctors here from all over the world. You realize there's more stress out there than even in the poorer countries. What accounts for this? It accounts for industrialization and the, um, the occupational medical doctors themselves who are kept in a comfortable zone and the application. Now what happens in the hospital is, if I don't go present that I need a problem, they won't intervene. So um, I'm looking at a model where it's a continuous basis. So it becomes a package, a complete package, just like uh, Dr. Um, um, you know, uh, Dr. Fomo just said, uh, like screening hepatitis or screening vaccination before you start working. Uh, that's something we have to include. Let it be a continuous package because you don't want uh, an outcome before a solution. You want a preventative approach where it becomes an embodiment of the functioning. And by the time we come in, we already anticipate that we can meet one, two, three challenges and we start preventing them. That can, in a big way, invest a lot of resource, you know, a lot of um, increased economic burden and, and really enhance the economy, uh, not just in the hospital, but overall. If I have any other points later on, I may bring this to contribute. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ambe. It's always a pleasure. Uh, we're glad to have you here today. I'm sure at this point, uh, our presenter must have had some sips of water and I'll hand over to um, Christelle to manage the question and answer session. Over to you, Christelle. 
Merci, Elvis. Merci encore, Dr. Ekiti, pour la présentation. Jusqu'ici, dans le chat, euh, déjà, je vais inviter chacun à peut-être lever la main pour ceux qui veulent contribuer et on pourra leur passer la parole. Mais dans le chat, nous avons aussi reçu des commentaires par plus, de plusieurs participants, notamment qui étaient très intéressés par les résultats de Sociocam, comme vous pouvez le voir mais aussi une expérience par Dr. Marc Schofford, son expérience en Allemagne, euh, à, à savoir euh, le, la santé au travail, notamment pour ceux qui travaillent à la maison et où euh, il partage une expérience de l'assurance qui parfois couvre certains frais liés euh, aux incidences de certaines pathologies. Donc, euh, le professeur Théodore Gatcho peut-être voudrait dire quelque chose, je vais lui passer la parole mieux s'il peut euh, s'exprimer oralement. Oh, um, thanks, Christelle. It's uh, Theodore Gatchu. Uh, I'm a gastroenterologist in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Ekiti, we are linked on uh, LinkedIn, and uh, I do follow a lot of your comments. And I was very interested in seeing your, in listening to your presentation today. I think uh, your presentation was a fantastic presentation. And what caught my attention like uh, everybody, I think is uh, the prevalence of a uh, chronic kidney disease in the working environment in certain professions in Cameroon. More importantly is actually the solution that you mentioned, just the fact of providing potable water to uh, the outdoor workers actually was sufficient to reduce the prevalence of chronic kidney disease in that, in that group of people. I think what you have just highlighted actually goes to show that very simple solutions can go a long way to prevent real serious complications. I think Dr. Dr. Kene made a statement about hepatitis B in Cameroon. And uh, that, that topic is a topic that is very, very close and dear to my heart. You know? And I'm really disappointed that uh, uh, countries like Cameroon have not actually taken up the possibility of vaccinating uh, people at a large scale, because I think we could eradicate hepatitis B from Cameroon if we vaccinated every child at birth. And that would be very cheap, just like providing water to reduce chronic kidney disease, vaccinating children for hepatitis B can eradicate hepatitis B. I think those are some of the little things that uh, public health can actually do. I think Dr. Ekiti, uh, very, very good endeavor. I don't know how I can help you, but uh, if you have any question or you think I can be of any help, do let me know. And I hope to catch up with you when I'm in Cameroon. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci, c'était plus une contribution et un appel à, à, au soutien à Dr. Ekiti qui est bien, qui est, qui est bien parvenu euh, aux oreilles. Merci infiniment pour votre contribution. Je voudrais revenir sur Dr. Marc Chauffeur. C'est possible qu'on vous euh, de partager votre expérience. Euh, S'il vous plaît, pouvez-vous vous présenter d'où vous, euh, vous joignez la paix? Déjà, vous avez mentionné dans le chat avant de partager votre expérience. Merci. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening once again. Um, I'm calling from Germany. I'm a medical physicist from uh, profession and um, I'm working for, for a company and for one year now, um, I've been in the home office. So it's a quite a new environment. And what really struck me from Dr. Akitik's talk is the point on mental health. So I think it, this, this is a point which is uh, very, very much neglected with regards to people working at home. So uh, it seems exciting working at home, but then you realize that the, the physical contact to colleagues is missing. And that's a very important part of the mental health. Um, so all the video calls you could be having on Teams and uh, you know the interactions you could be having, 
those those do not um, replace the physical interactions you're having with people at the workplace, which I think is a very very important uh, synergistic thing which we need. Uh, just like just just the, it's difficult to, to to talk about like just the pheromones and everything else which you experience by having people around you uh, plays a very important role on mental health. So that's one thing which I took out of this talk, really, really important. Um, the other thing I thought about, which I've not yet seen happen, is um, an accident uh, at home and, uh, you know, um, possible, uh, let's say, a possible reaction from, from an insurance or so. We are well covered here in Germany, for instance. We are over-insured, so to speak, and just like many other uh, first world countries, I think. Um, with, with, with reimbursement of costs when you are, um, when there's an incident, I think that's not going to be a problem. If that falls within your working hours, you could always justify what happened. And one of the many different insurance packages which apply would be able to cover you. So that's not the problem, but, but I think taking this now to the settings back home where um, such insurances may not be present, uh, it makes it more challenging. So I, I think, the home office thing is, is a double-edged sword. It, it could seem quite attractive um, and it's really difficult to assess, uh, most especially um, the mental health situation of the, the worker. So thanks once more, Dr. Ikiti. I found out really great, thanks. Merci beaucoup, merci Dr. Chofa pour votre contribution à cette à ces échanges, je vais revenir sur un point que vous avez relevé, la santé mentale qui de plus en plus est, très, euh, est un problème qu'on rencontre dans tous les domaines, tant liés à la, ou de la vie, des problèmes individuels. Et je me demandais, docteur Ikiti, est-ce qu'il y, euh, est qu y a une procédure, est-ce qu'il y a un questionnaire, comment évaluer la santé mentale? Vous avez une expérience dans euh, les études, comment évaluer la santé mentale dans un, dans un milieu de service, dans un corps, parce que je vois que de plus en plus, il y a des personnes qui en souffrent et qui peut être l'une des raisons de, comme vous avez marqué, de l'assentéisme ou alors de présentéisme, si c'est ça la traduction en français, je me permets, mais je voudrais bien avoir votre expérience sur, sur ça, c'est vraiment un problème, mais de plus en plus on en rencontre, merci. Et après je passerai la parole à ceux qui ont levé la main. Merci Christelle. Euh, bon. Je sais, à à l'école, on nous a appris que quand on vous pose une question en français, il faut répondre en français. Quand on vous, quand on vous la pose en anglais, il faut répondre en anglais. Mais en général, since most of us are English speaking, I would imagine, just looking at the names of the participants, um, yes, there are ways of identifying burnout, but that's just because, I, these are things that I would identify just because I'm a healthcare professional, right? I've not received any training per se to evaluate for burnout in the workplace. But so burnout symptoms are the same you know, symptoms of burnout, you know, which are, which are very closely related to the symptoms of depression, major depressive disorder in general. But, you know, when you see these at the workplace and then in the, in the history taking, you can, you know, identify certain stressors or certain conditions or predisposing conditions that, that that can explain why the person is feeling like this in the workplace then you can link burnout to to to, to the workplace in my experience um i would have liked to have been able to collect more data than i currently have uh the the problem the my my experience has shown that the problem with occupational medicine in cameroon is two things first of all those who work in the company we are burdened with primary care we are burdened with taking care of the malaria in the in the children that come to consult, taking care of uh, those who are struggling to go home because they just have no, they just don't want to be in the office, and we have very little time to dedicate to actual research work, which is what I am very very passionate about. Actually, it's part of the reason why you know I'm in the process of doing what I'm doing now, which is transitioning, but. It, that's been my experience. So we are burdened with, uh, with, with the primary care aspect of it. For example, to put things in perspective, in Sonora, we are about 650 workers, full-time staff, with another 300 or so subcontractors, and they're just two doctors at any given time. So you can imagine how many people you have to see on a daily basis. So you have the workers, and then you have their family members, and everybody who has a headache has to go through you. So this is some, these are some of the things that, you know, those, those of us who are on the call who have who are who probably have the same experience. What is your take? How do you engage in actual 
progressive research work, right? That can help to, to, to improve the health of workers in general. I had to take my, 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 my experience or my expertise out of the office to the community to be able to engage in some of the things that we did because in the office it was just simply diff- a lot more difficult. But that's just to give you an idea about how you can evaluate some of these things in the workplace, you know, from your background as being a healthcare professional and then how you can, you know, split your time even in the office between primary care and, uh, and some of the other progressive things that one can be called upon to do. Merci. Merci pour l'expérience. Je crois que c'est un débat, c'est ouvert. Et je voudrais appeler les, euh, un par un ceux qui ont levé les mains. C'est, les gens sont bilingues, donc si vous vous sentez mieux à l'aise en français, vous posez votre question en français. Si vous vous sentez mieux à l'aise en anglais, vous y allez. Je vais appeler ici Daniel Mabongo, prière de vous présenter, vous vous joignez l'appel et votre question. Merci. Daniel, vous avez la parole. Hello, uh, me, uh, merci, merci pour la parole. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Daniel Mabongo. I'm a medical professor uh, epidemiology, FGP Cameroon. And currently, I'm the, the original coordinator for HIV in Southwest region. So, unfortunately, I didn't um, follow the presentation of uh, Dr. Martins, but uh, all the question or the contribution after just um uh, call for uh my attention and this is one of our goals this year um, in the region because we realized that especially for um civil servant working at the health facility level we realize there is not really a policies to follow up because we know that the uh, how worker they are exposed to many infectious diseases for example, B hepatitis, we have a, um, HIV, for example, uh, after um, an, expose, an exposure to blood or other biological fluids. But we realize that there is not really a policy for the follow up of this um, particular population, the health worker. Maybe you can just have some um, protocol in the gui- in the guideline in case of blood exposure. That's what you have to do. But now the follow up, nothing is available. Even if you are looking the data that we are collecting, it's just a cross sectional data. Like okay, this is the number of people has been exposed to blood, um, to blood or other um, biological fluids. But after that, so what? There's no data to capture this uh, particular information. So this year, we um, we had a meeting and we decided to maybe try to see how we can start maybe in the big health facilities, um, third category regional hospital, for example, to try to, to assign one register for the cohort monitoring of the health worker victim of blood um, exposure. So it was just, I think that, um, Occupational medicine now is most focused in the on the private sector, but as um, one of the moderator was saying, the government uh, is the person employing the most people in Cameroon. But now, if I'm focused at the, my area, I realize that concerning the HIV, for example, maybe be hepatitis, we can try to do something, and maybe the solution can um, come from the Southwest region. So this was just a contribution and thank you for this um, particular topic. Over to you. Merci Cordo pour votre contribution. C'est très important déjà de, à, notre, à, à chacun à son niveau et déjà au niveau du Sud-Ouest pour les efforts que vous faites de, d'essayer de documenter parce que aussi euh, les évidents comme on l'a vu avec l'expérience du docteur Ekit, c'est d'avoir des données pour convaincre, OK, on a ça et comment, à, à base de ces données, on peut euh, améliorer des stratégies pour euh, essayer de résoudre le problème. C'est vrai que c'est le gouvernement qui doit le faire, mais chacun à son petit niveau déjà peut essayer de générer des données et avec les soutiens, euh, on peut euh, passer à l'étape su- euh, suivante. Merci infiniment pour votre contribution. Je crois que c'était plus une contribution qu'une question. Et je voudrais passer la parole à Toan Yu, excusez-moi si je prononce mal, Toan Yu Jingi. Merci, madame la modératrice. Christelle, que je connais un peu. 
bonsoir à tout le monde. Je vais apporter ma solidarité à Christelle qui s'exprime en français. Je pense que c'est la langue où je me sens également le plus à l'aise. Je suis heureuse de prendre la parole à Cameroun Town Hall. J'ai souvent assisté à des, à des conférences, mais je n'ai pas encore eu à prendre la parole. Je suis heureuse de, de prendre la parole sur une problématique qui est très importante dans notre contexte. Bon, ça a déjà été dit, mais j'ose encore le dire. J'ai apprécié vraiment la présentation du docteur Kichi. Bon, vu son fond d'écran, on comprend qu'il a le sens du goût et du détail. Bon, merci pour la présentation. Ma contribution va commencer par un commentaire. Euh, C'est une anecdote, en fait. J'ai un ami qui a un ami qui a laissé former dans un pays asiatique en médecine. D'accord, il a laissé former en médecine. Et puis, il revient au Cameroun. Ton ami l'a informé en quoi Médecine du travail. Médecine du travail. Il rentre au Cameroun. Il veut travailler où Il était surpris. Il dit, mais il veut travailler où Comment J'ai dit, justement, il veut travailler où Je suis dans la santé. Je n'ai jamais entendu parler de médecine du travail. Ton ami vient avec information de médecine du travail. C'est pour travailler où C'est pour vous dire à quel point ça peut être pointu, cette question, puisque même le personnel de santé ne sait pas à suffisance que il y a un domaine de la santé qui est appelé médecine du travail. Donc, je suis vraiment ravie de cet échange et je me dis, au sortir d'ici, est-ce que ce n'est déjà pas possible? Certes, c'est le gouvernement qui organise tout, qui a le, 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 le bras directeur, mais est-ce que ce n'est pas possible au sortir de cette présentation, de cet échange avec environ 40 participants, de sortir un projet qui peut, par exemple, permettre de créer, je ne sais pas moi, un centre. Là, tout de suite, il me vient venu le CIFRAM, Centre de formation, de recherche et d'application en médecine du travail. CIFRAM Work, un mot un peu bilingue. Puisque c'est vrai, il y a des, des, des recherches individuelles qui peuvent être menées, mais nous savons tous comment les recherches individuelles sont... Donc, je ne veux pas être dans la langue de bois, mais quand même, nous, nous, nous savons que la diaspora a le pouvoir. Moi qui suis heureuse de partager avec vous, déjà, j'appelle depuis au Cameroun, Yaoundé. Moi qui suis heureuse de partager ce moment de, de réflexion avec vous. Et je sais, nous savons tous que la diaspora a le pouvoir. Récemment, on a eu un échange sur cette même plateforme à l'ONU, c'est la santé publique, qui donnait la main à la diaspora et leur donnait les possibilités. Est-ce que cette main ne peut pas être saisie et arrachée à la rigueur avec la création d'un déjà d'un petit centre de formation, de recherche et d'application à médecine du travail afin que le plaidoyer soit continué avec les recherches individuelles qui seront menées et euh, toute la panoplie de procédures qu'il va, qu va falloir mettre en œuvre. Nous connaissons également comment il est difficile de mettre en œuvre les procédures dans notre pays. Euh, voilà, tous ces efforts coordonnés à pour avoir quelque chose de concret dans peu de temps, parce que vraiment, c'est urgent. L'application de la médecine du travail, la médecine du travail au Cameroun est urgente. Je nous en prie, réfléchissons dans ce sens, dans le sens pratique, avant euh, euh, d'avoir les, 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 les autorisations déjà. Je vous remercie. J'espère n'avoir pas été très longue et bonne fin de session à tout le monde. Merci, Christelle. Merci, Sabine, pour votre contribution et votre suggestion. Je vais laisser l'honneur à Dr. Ekiti de se prononcer sur l'idée qu'elle propose et après le chairman voudra bien euh, apporter un, un élément de réponse. Dr. Ekiti. Oui, bon, je vais aussi euh, m'exprimer en français, juste pour la bonne gouverne de Samy, Sabine, puisqu'elle elle se sent beaucoup plus à l'aise en français. Euh, oui, je suis beaucoup pour l'idée de, 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 de s'informer et aussi d'informer les autres sur euh, que ce soit les données, que ce soit les avancées, que ce soit les, les, la réalité de la médecine du travail au Cameroun. Comme vous avez très bien évoqué, il est, il est, il est, il est vrai. Mais il est choquant d'apprendre que même les médecins ne savent pas de quoi il est question quand on parle de la médecine du travail. Euh, ma, ma, ma position est qu'il faut, par tous les moyens possibles, multiplier la possibilité de collecter les données pour pouvoir sortir des recherches, des, 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 comment dirais-je, des... des, des, des 
des projets de recherche pour s'informer et pour informer la communauté scientifique d'une part, mais aussi les, les, les décideurs ou bien les policy makers en général, en ce qui concerne la protection de la santé du travailleur. La protection de la santé du travailleur. Comme j'ai dans, dans au début de, à l'entame de ma présentation, j'ai parlé d'un certain nombre de, de, de personnes qui forment l'équipe de santé au travail ou bien de la médecine du travail. Il y a beaucoup d'intervenants, y compris les, 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 les délégués du personnel qui n'ont souvent rien à voir avec la médecine, mais qui font partie de, du comité d'hygiène et sécurité au travail juste parce que c'est à eux de relayer l'information auprès des travailleurs. Donc, moi, je pense que si par exemple les CHST dans les différentes entités. Il y a aussi un CHST national. S'ils peuvent avoir quelque part où ils puissent des informations pour pouvoir influencer ou bien orienter les politiques au niveau des entreprises, au niveau de l'État, au niveau des différentes entités en général, ça sera une très, 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 très extrêmement bonne idée. Ça sera une extrêmement bonne idée. Moi, je ne vais pas prétendre dire que je suis le plus expérimenté en médecine du travail. Je vais commencer par dire que je ne suis même pas un médecin spécialiste en médecine du travail. J'ai juste eu la, la chance et, et l'opportunité de pouvoir exercer dans un service de médecine du travail. Et fort de mon expérience, de ce que j'avais fait auparavant, dans la médecine du travail, je me suis beaucoup impliqué et, 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 et on a pu faire ce qu'on a pu faire au niveau de la SUNA et dans la communauté en général. Il y a des, il y a des, des spécialistes de médecine du travail, il y en a beaucoup au Cameroun. J'ai même dit dans, dans les commentaires que maintenant, il y a déjà une option de spécialité en médecine du travail à l'Université de Yaoundé, la Faculté de médecine et sciences biomédicales. Donc, il y a des, des, il y a des, 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 des personnes qui ont des connaissances à le faire. Maintenant, il manque, à mon avis, il manque seulement un, l'organisation. Deux, la volonté de ceux qui ont cette expérience et qui ont cette volonté. Voilà. Euh, qui ont, qui ont, l'organisation pour qu'ils fassent ce qu'ils doivent faire pour informer vraiment euh, la, la communauté scientifique par rapport à la santé au travail. Merci. OK. Well, uh... Christelle, I'm going to use the opportunity also to ask my question when I finish. I think uh, the proposers were excellent proposers, but I'm one of those who believe in research to influence policy. So we start by proposing research, get evidence-based medicine where we can provide evidence in order for us to justify what we're doing. And I think Cameroon really being the government, being the highest uh, employer, is the government's position and our position to advocate so that the government can continue the training of occupational physicians and nurses and allied workers, because always it's a team that has to come together. We are very skilled in Cameroon and we are good at training physicians alone and forgetting about the others. And so the team is never in place. That's really the problem we have at times. The team is never in place. I don't know if there's any drive to even train occupational nurses in place. I don't know if there's any drive to train all the other allied workers that need to be in place for this uh, whole team to work. My real preoccupation it is, what do you think? You've worked in Cameroon, you're working in Parastata. Parastatas are really well taken care of. Parastatas have things in place. But when you come to the government, I did work in Cameroon and uh, had the opportunity to be a director of a district hospital, but there was no emphasis at any time in our employment to check if we do have TB, TB screening. I'm just going to give some few pre-employment physical exams that we do for everyone who's getting into the military and other things. We don't do that for those who are employing. Drug screening, alcohol. We have people who come intoxicated at work in the morning. As you said, there is uh, presenteeism in Cameroon a lot. Those who are present but not working, especially government workers. There is issue of uh, those who are not respiratory even fit to be there as a result of smoking, as a result of being in charcoal kitchens and all of that, blood-borne diseases, as I made mention of. It's actually a pandemic in Cameroon. We're vaccinating children, but we've forgotten to vaccinate healthcare workers who actually are getting needle sticks and other things. And they are getting, they were not in the age gap to have received vaccination when they were children. I was not. So when I was moving to the US, I had to get all my hepatitis C and pay for the hepatitis B series myself. 
So things like testing for lead and those who work in organizations that are really exposing them and buildings also regulations. So that's why I really found your topic very interesting and your discussion. What is What do you propose that we can do as a town hall in order to advocate that these changes be made at the level of healthcare workers, at the level of workers in general in Cameroon who are working for the government? Maybe I'm giving you, you a task, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, thank you, thank you, Muno. Thank you, Muno, for the question. Actually, I like question and answer because it's during Q&A that you get to remember or come up with some of the things that you normally should have put in your presentation, right? So I know that you're someone who values a lot of what can be done now. So I'm going to share something that came to mind about something that we can do right now. Right. So if you're someone who follows news like me, I follow Cameroon news a lot. You see that there's a there's a drive, right? There's a move. The employment of state officials in the healthcare sector from under the medical doctors all the way down is no longer going to be the responsibility of the central government or the responsibility of the Ministry of Public Health per se. It's going to be the responsibility of what we call collectivité territorial decentralisation. So it's going to be up to the mayors and the, uh, the regional councils to recruit healthcare professionals. That is under the doctors. So the doctors are still going to be employed by the Ministry of Public Health and the Ministry of, no, Ministry of Public Service, right? But from the nurses, the nursing aides, everybody else that works in the, in the hospital is going to be employed locally. That's a move with the Ministry of Decentralization. So something that can be done right now, even before that thing starts, is to advocate at the level of the Ministry of Decentralization, such that when these recruitments are happening, because these recruitments are going to be happening, because after the Ministry of the Minister of Decentralization came out with that, you know, with that emphasis, the Minister of the Minister of Public Health said that he is delegating the responsibility of the accompaniment of this recruitment at the local level to the regional delegates of public health. So right now we can talk to all the regional delegates of public health and advocate that a minimum screening package or a minimum visit or a visit d'embauche, as we call it in French, a minimum visit d'embauche is done for all healthcare professionals before they get hired at the local level. That's something that we can do right now because we have access to the regional delegates. We also have access to the local government. We can talk to them. We can talk to them. Now, um, how is that going to be funded? I'll leave that to health economics, health economists to discuss that. I'll leave that to those who are skilled in that domain to talk about that. But that's an idea. That's something that can potentially be done. And then somebody said in the, in the chat section or in the comment section that we need to prone or we need to encourage building from the ground up. It's going to be, I, in my opinion, it's going to be easier to implement something in Limbe than it is to implement in Cameroon. That has always been my approach to whether it be my research or whether it be my work in general. I would like to see something done in one place first and see how it works, how it can be funded, how it can be implemented, how it can be followed up before you think about generalizing it to the rest, to the rest of the area. So that is what I'll say, for example, in response to your question. That is something I think that can be done uh, to, to help occupational medicine, occupational health in the public sector, as opposed to in the private and the parasitical sector, where, like someone said, it's usually more organized and more taken, more, or more well taken care of. Yeah, yeah um, thank you. Christelle, before you continue, I just want to um, uh, bring back AKT on this subject. Sometimes I get uh, worried about the intention uh, behind a particular action. If you are screening workers before enrollment into a service, your intention might be biased because you want to get very healthy workers and you want that the nurses and doctors should be healthy and you screen them. So that's a little bit more punitive even than even the general good of wanting to see that you cater for their health. And if you do that, that would be a good thing. You're going to screen some people. They're not going to be healthy. So what are you, what are you going to do? They're not going to get employed. So then if they are not employed, what has happened to them? They have been punished. Who is taking care of them thereafter? Is there any follow-up for those that are positive for hepatitis B now, or those that are positive for HIV, or those that... In, and that's where you start finding workers going, finding escape routes now. Once they notice that this screening is to recruit those who are healthy, 
they'll look for all escape routes to find every way to get in despite their health condition. And I think once the intention behind actions like this it presents itself in such a way that it is for the general good of everyone who is receiving this screening and not rather like a barrier or maybe a, 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 a way to put some people away, you'll find more collaboration and other services will pick up to screen their workers generally. And if it is, if the, the way we tell the story to other corporations is that screen your workers regularly so they can know about their health and take action, that'll be better so that workers don't shy away from screening and they don't run away, but they rather look at the overall intention, which is to provide, you know, um, you know, quality health and also just die, early die detection of disease and uh, provide a solution to it. Just, I wanted to bring that uh, contribution and also, um, whilst you were talking, I thought about the fact that the person in charge of uh, all state workers is the Minister of Public Service. And so uh, one of the things the town hall will be looking at will be to bring the Minister of Public Service to the town hall so we can all do the same thing we did with the Minister of Public Health, who has now is in the process of creating a committee in charge of diaspora alone to see how we can contribute back home to improve on healthcare. We should bring the Minister of Public uh, Service here to talk about occupational health of state workers. And uh, Mono Chair, that's my humble submission. How we're going to do it is uh, what we can discuss you, backstage. You, you, you make things happen. So I don't know how you're going to do it, but we're going to do it together as a team. And all those who are here, I think there may be members here who know him and can link us to the minister. And as you said well, before going to the other questions, it's always good to provide uh, solutions when we are screening. If we're screening for TB, then we should have solutions for those who are positive. We're not screening to prevent them from getting it, from getting, they should know that from getting the job. They're going to get the job, but we're screening them in order to treat them so that they don't infect others. I had a, I had a friend who had had TB in Cameroon, multi-drug resistant TB, and was working among other healthcare workers till the time he decided to migrate out of Cameroon. And first screening for job where he was in the United Arab Emirates, he was diagnosed with multi-drug resistant TB, positive sputum. He's healthy, no HIV, nothing. This tells you how much he actually infected those who were around him. And these are the good advantages of getting these things done. It's not really done for the sake of, and people's families will get protected for screening them for hepatitis. We have treatment which we can help. We have vaccinations that we can give for those who are not immune because you're screening not only to get those who are infected, those who are not immune, we can provide them with vaccines, which we need to, as Ekiti said, health economics, we need to look for a way of financing these things. Those who know that they are HIV negative, if they are being screened, they change their behavior. I know that once you get screening, the behavior changes for a year or two, and then maybe they may go back to their old mode. Those who are drug seeking may help actually to make people understand that drug test is going to be done, and maybe the consumption of uh, Torado in Cameroon and all those things people smoke will reduce. So Elvis, it's, as you said, it's a wonderful thing for us to portray the reason why we're doing this. So thank you. Let me, let me cut. There are a lot of hands that are up. Merci, merci beaucoup pour les différentes contributions et les réactions. Tout à l'heure, j'ai vu, vu connecter le, dé, le délégué régional du sud-ouest, mais je ne le retrouve plus, mais on va revenir probablement. On va passer à la dernière série de questions, puisqu'on on est tenu par le temps. Et je vais donner la parole à Brian. Et après, je vais donner à Ekema. Merci. Uh, merci, merci beaucoup, uh, Christelle, uh, pour, pour uh, ton, uh, to, uh, for the moderation and uh, everything. Uh, Dr. Kitty, uh, I'm really wondering if you have some some very successful models in maybe in Africa. If there are other countries that you've seen that have implemented some pretty good um, standards for occupational medicine uh, in the workplace, I, I think maybe the United States might be kind of uh, a different situation. But um, really want to know what your experience has been. Have you seen some you know, models that are really uh, working in other African countries that Cameroon can potentially tap into and probably build upon. And uh, and uh, when the question around research uh, came up, I was thinking if um, 
And I think it would be a great idea and that's something that we certainly can push forward and, and try to do um, uh, an analysis on. But I'm wondering if you, you have seen some particular professions or industries in Cameroon that have higher risk of, uh, of illnesses or occupational uh, injuries that, I, uh, that, um, uh, that probably we are not talking about and, um, and how potentially the government can be involved in supporting and building uh, the kind of occupational health program that will protect and, and, and support uh, these health workers. Um, over to you, Martin. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian, for the question. Um, I would, so you had you asked two questions. I want to start with the second before going back to the first. Uh, the second is about are there any particular industries where the risk is higher? So occupational health the world over will tell you that um, the work-related diseases that are is most easy to link to, or the diseases that are most easy to link to, 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 to the workplace are diseases that are caused by elements that you will not encounter in your daily life. For example, if you have someone who is a plumber or someone who works in, um, uh, what's in building, it's very likely that that person is going to be more exposed to lead than you and me especially since lead paint was taken out of general uh, circulation. So if you're looking for the health impact of lead, it's easy to say that, okay, I'm going to find, you know, people exposed to lead in this particular industry. So that's how it goes really. Now, another thing is you talk about uh, pulmonary or, or respiratory conditions, which, are, which is another group or constellation of, of conditions that are very highly linked with uh, with occupation, and you have things like exposure to 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 uh, uh, the, 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 you know the, the element escapes my memory now. But you have exposure to some substances that lead to COPD, right? And it's usually that's those are some of the typical things that you see linked to to to, to the workplace. And it's it, it's usually because it is hard to say that your diabetes was caused by your job because the risk factors of diabetes go beyond the workplace, right? So it is, it's, it's, more, it's more difficult to have that direct cause to effect relation with industries that, and conditions that are not directly linked to things that you will not find outside of in, in, the, regular, in, regular, in the regular population, the general population. So I think that in my way of answering your question is there's industries that have already identified uh, dangerous substances. Now, these are generally heavy metals. These are also um, uh, hydrocarbons. People who come in contact with hydrocarbons in refineries, you don't have a lot of contact with hydrocarbons because it's usually a closed circuit. But there are some areas, there are some areas, there are some gaps. Uh, there's also respiratory, um, resp you know, risk factors for COPD that are usually not found in the general population. So these are some of, that's, that's to, 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 to respond to your sec the second part of your question. Now, the first part of your question, are there any models that have worked? We don't even look, need to look further than Cameroon to see what can be done when it comes to work-related injuries. I spoke about CMPS earlier on. CMPS is, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, I don't, I don't impose it on anyone, is one of the better run companies, state-owned companies in Cameroon. In fact, in CMPS, you can probably rest assured that when they are thorough when they go through the processes and, 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 and they do a good job when it comes to evaluating information that comes to them and going out, going, give, giving, out giving out services or rendering services in general. So, so CMPS is the only entity in Cameroon that compensates work-related injuries. So I would put it to anyone. I'll put the challenge to anyone, be it a student, be it a worker, be it someone who is looking for research, to go to CMPS, talk to them, and see whether you can ask them to retrospectively look at their work or their data when it comes to work-related injuries, and then see whether there's something that can be done further on. Because I, who has worked in a company, know that when there's a workplace injury, you have a deadline that you must submit the information to CMPS. CMPS collects the data. CMPS does an investigation. 
CMPS has a doctor that would invite the patient over to do a cross evaluation of the initial evaluation that was done. CMPS would determine the percentage of disability, if any, CMPS would determine the compensation to give the person and CMPS gives the person a compensation. What I don't, what I've not seen in my personal experience is CMPS coming later on to the place where this person had this injury to ensure that the, in French we call it arbre de cause, which is a risk analysis that was done post injury. There was a risk analysis, was there a risk analysis that was done post injury? Were there recommendations that, came from that risk analysis. Have these recommendations been implemented? Now, I have not seen CMPS do that. I have not seen anybody do that. It's up to the company to evaluate the injury, to do the risk analysis based on the injury, and to implement the measures later on. It is, right now, it's up in the air whose responsibility it is to ensure that these recommendations are actually followed. In my experience, most of the time when the risk analysis have been done, the Occupational medicine physician is not a part of the risk analysis committee because it's a very technical committee that has to do with where the person worked, what kind of work were they doing, and so on and so forth. And it does not necessarily include the, 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 the occupational medicine physician unless it's a real uh, injury, unless it's a real, a very palpable injury that leads to some consequences. For example, there were some that included the, the occupational health physician. For example, if someone has a, 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 a first degree burn or a second degree burn even because they're exposed to heat at the workplace, it doesn't lead to lost time due to injury because we have, a, some, we have something in the company that is called a, the record days without injury or, or, or accident. So if a condition doesn't affect or negatively affect that record, the occupational health physician is usually not called upon. And so you have second degree burns that are being handled by whoever it is that, that, that uh, evaluated the case without, in, without necessarily involving the occupational medicine team. So all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is occupational health or work-related work injuries, it's very possible to go through what we have already done to see what can be done or see what can be improved. When it comes to work-related diseases, like I said, in my research so far, I've not seen any in Africa. I've not seen any in Cameroon. So I'll really be, be interested to read studies. If anybody here can find studies about work-related diseases, whether in Cameroon or outside of Cameroon in Africa, that we can see how we can model or scale these models into Cameroon or how we can implement them in Cameroon. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Ekiti, pour, la, pour votre question. Um, Dr. Fergus, permettez que je passe la parole à M. Ekema et puis je reviens vers vous. J'espère que c'est M. Ekema, uh, prière de vous présenter, et M. ou Madame, et poser yeah, votre Dr. question. Ekema. Dr. Ekema, merci. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ekiti. I am very impressed about your presentation. My name is Dr. Ekema Anjorin. I have been an occupational health physician for CDC for 10 years and the medicine to travail for 10 years in Limbe. So what he was saying, the basic thing is that we have inadequate funding for research. If you want to do anything, it has to come with data and we have not been doing that data. So people cannot really know what is happening. But then when we talked about the organization of uh, occupational health in Cameroon, I think like we mentioned, the, the companies have done a, a good job. They have not done too well because the enforcement of occupational health uh, in Cameroon is done by the Ministry of Labor. And the Ministry of Labor has not been doing their job properly. The Ministry of Labor controls labor medicine. It's not the Ministry of Health. So the Ministry of Labor gives accreditation to doctors to be able to practice labor medicine. And because of this, people have corrupted the system. We have government doctors doing occupational medicine. It is a situation where 
People just do it because they want to make money, not because they want to help. Like Dr. Ekiti said, the pre-medical examination is very, very important. And somebody was saying that it is going to screen people out. Yes, it can screen people out because it's meant to do that. The reason for pre-medical examination is one, you want to know the baseline information of that particular health individual. If the person is able to do the kind of work he's been proposed to do. For example, if somebody is going to work in a confined space, for example, and the person has a vital capacity that cannot support that kind of uh, uh, job. If you don't do a vital capacity for that uh, worker, the person will go into the tanks and the person will collapse because he, the vital capacity is low. So we do all those tests to make sure that we screen people for their various jobs and make sure that they can do it. That's why the pre-medical exam is not just a baseline. It is done according to the work that you are going to do. So we try as much as possible to get the information to see that we get the best worker for that particular uh, job. And when they go out to do this job, they have to do it in such a way that they will come out with the best results. Because if somebody goes there and because you are feeling uncomfortable inside the tank, and you're feeling uncomfortable, are you supposed to weld a particular place? And because you're feeling uncomfortable, you want to come out early because you feel uncomfortable, then you're not going to do the job and it might lead to industrial accidents. So you can see how much work that is needed to be done. When you talk about um, occupational health, it is not only for the workers. It concerns the environment in which the industry is located. For example, I was a consultant for Cosmo Energy. Cosmo Energy was trying to do a corporate social responsibility project for health in a particular local locality in Boa Balondo. And they wanted somebody to tell them what they can do to be able to help the village and the villagers. And the fallouts of their industry, how it was going to affect the village. So they needed a consultant to give them the uh, programs that they could do. I came out with five programs and I recommended those five programs that other oil companies in Douala are using because it was the, the research was uh, given out to those companies. Every, all the companies are using that. I have also, Dr. Kitty did not know, but I will send you my paper. I have done research for economic impact of HIV in CDC. This was presented in, in CASA in 1990, <laughs> because you were still in school by that time. But then we have a, the w, uh, ILO had a seminar in Douala organized by GCAM. And I was one of the facilitators. And what we did was to recommend to different companies, all the big companies that were there, we recommended the minimum package for uh, uh, occupational health for those companies. And there is a society for health, safety, and environment in Douala. That was an outcome of that, uh, that meeting. So uh, occupational health physicians are part of that society for health, uh, uh, health and environment, health, safety, and environment. The Ministry of uh, Labor and the Ministry of um, Health have to be able to work together like the new uh, law that uh, Dr. Ekiti is talking about. They have to be able to work together to make sure that they can enforce that, to make sure that workers have, it is very important and mandatory. You must have pre-medical examination. And at the end of the day, after your employment, you are supposed to have a post-medical examination because the baseline, you have the baseline history of the worker. You know how the, what condition the patient, the worker came into the uh, company. 
there are some workers that will come into the company and within that period, they acquire diseases from other elsewhere. And they say, oh, it's because I worked in this company. But when they came, they had underlying conditions. So all those, those things are things that have to be put in black and white so that people can know that these conditions existed by the time you come. And if you cannot do that particular job, you'll be moved to another place where your services could be used. It doesn't mean that they will say they will not take you. If you can't do that particular job, you will move to a, a particular area where you, your services will be used. So that's my contribution. I had so many things to talk, but I, I just forgot about it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, the last thing that I'll mention is that if we are doing research, if we are doing research, the research most of the times for the companies, companies are thinking about productivity. They are thinking about the money that they are going to make. They are not thinking about the money that they are going to spend. So the company has to be sensitized. And the only way to do it, like Dr. Kitty said, is through data. Get enough data and show them that this is happening. If we have this information, if we, if we treat these patients, we'll get less loss of man hours. Loss of man hours will lead to production, uh, uh, increased productivity, and you make more money in the long run. So those companies will be able to give money for research. I had a lot of problems in CDC trying to get money for research. My boss, Dr. Agbo, is here. You would know I was always asking for money to do research, but they, they said, oh, you're just going to spend our money. But the reason was that we needed that information to be able to show that we can, the company will benefit more from the research that we've been done. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci infiniment, Dr. Ekema, pour votre participation. C'est l'expérience que vous partagez avec tout le monde. Dr. Ekiti aussi ne m'en conviendrait pas. Donc, nous sommes parvenus à la fin de, de, la fin de notre échange. Je vais donner la, dernière, la parole à Huguette pour la dernière question parce qu'on est tenu par le temps. Et prière d'être euh, euh, bref. Dr. Huguette, vous avez la parole. Uh, bonjour, Dr. Christelle. Uh, merci pour la question. Uh, also, uh, I'll start, Dr. Ekema. Uh, thank you so much for the contribution. Uh, I am very impressed by your extensive experience. And then my question um, are directed to Dr. Ikiti uh, with two different leads. Uh, the mental health in workplace and uh, the use of uh, digital equipment. So uh, firstly, uh, I don't know if you can provide a definition of burnout because I know uh, we encounter different type of illness, mental illness in workplace. And then what are the different type of illness? What is burnout? And what are the other type of illness? And then uh, what are the causes? What are the different factors uh, which lead to those mental illness or which can cause those mental illness? And how can we prevent them either uh, personally or at a large scale level? And then so do, these are uh, those questions are with the first lead and then the second is um, the second the second question is about the use of digital equipment uh, because we have to use a lot either through social media or the exposition to computers so i was just wondering is there uh, an impact on the health either maybe the vision or the nervous system or whatsoever or another or another um, Oh, uh, another, what would I say, another system. So is there an impact of the use of digital equipment? Uh, so thank you so much again. So thank you, Uget, for your questions. Uh, the first one, I think I already sent a response in the comment section. I think it's, easy, it's easier that way. That's uh, the link is from the WHO is their definition of burnout, especially in the operational sector. Uh, your second question about the impact of 
digital devices on uh, on on health. You know, it's it's not an occupational health problem per se. It's not specifically occupational health because we have these devices everywhere. But um, you know, we can talk about that for hours. You know how 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 destructive using a computer screen is to your eyes. You know, most of us who are on this call wear glasses, and you know whether that be genetic or that be the, due to the fact that we have. We have looked at computer screens for very long. It's debatable, but you know those are all some of the things. Those are some of the things that can have that using these digital devices for long can have a, an impact on. You know, we also know that using devices before going to bed can have an impact on your sleep. And if you have a uh, impacted sleep, if you have sleep disorders or an impacted sleep cycle, then you, it has a constellation of other things that can happen if you use these devices before going to bed. So thank you very much for your questions. Like Christelle said, uh, we can go on and on. And as uh, you know, we can talk about these things in the in the parking lot. I'm going to leave it to the moderators to close out. Thank you very much. Merci infiniment. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Rikiti. Merci pour le temps. Merci pour la, le, les présentations très digestes, pour les réponses aux questions très actives. Merci à chacun d'avoir été là. C'était très intéressant, mais on est tenu par le temps. Je vais passer la parole à Elvis pour clore la session d'aujourd'hui. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Christelle, pour la modération. Thank you, everybody, for a very wonderful session. It's been great. Brian, some last words from you before I close. I know you've really been... Uh, can uh, introduce the uh, subject of today. No, thanks. I, I, I was blown away. I think um, uh, not, not, very, not very surprising to see that uh, Ekiti presented, uh, gave a really excellent and engaging uh, presentation. I think that's just who he is. And uh, you can see he's very driven by this and very passionate about this. And I think the, 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 this uh, session uh, generated a lot of uh, questions, a lot of issues that I think we might need to readdress in future sessions. We might need to invite, uh, uh, probably bring into the town hall the, the, the Minister of Public Service or the Minister of Labor as well at some point uh, to engage in this in this discussion as well. And I think it would be great to have uh, to have that engagement. So uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Kizzi, for your presentation. I think that was really great. That was exceptional. That was uh, engaging and uh, definitely looking forward to connecting with you later on. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Brian. It was really exceptional and engaging. Uh, let's get the last words from our chair, Dr. Munake. Um, just want to thank uh, Dr. Ikiti, also thank Dr. Ikema for their wonderful uh, experience and uh, really Ikema, Dr. Ikema for his years of experience in adding to this discussion today. You all saw Dr. Ikiti is a brilliant mind and uh, truly was a very engaging discussion. And uh, as everyone is saying, we're going to also get to talk about burnout. I think it's a topic that has come up time after time. And uh, we may have to get a session where we'll talk about burnout and also talk about the psychosocial impact of, uh, of, of this on health workers and also on uh, those who are in the labor market. So I want to thank all the participants who are here. Know that the town hall is a forum, is a town hall where we actually do engage. We're not here to lecture anyone. We're here, we just have someone who's gonna guide the discussion as you guys see. And please, it's open for all Cameroon healthcare professionals and uh, also those who are lovers of healthcare professionals and those who are doing innovation in the healthcare sector who want to use this platform and for all organizations, it's just a platform that we're using in order to share ideas, to generate uh, great uh, solutions to problems where we can actually channel them to the Cameroonian government, we can channel them to parastatus, and we can learn to solve problems back at home. So you guys are always welcome. You can always contact any of the moderators if you want to present. You have a topic that you want us to talk about you can send an email to any of the moderators. And I want to thank you all for your time. There is also the parking lot, which is going to be like 30 minutes. We'll would have time to talk about things we cannot talk online because it's going to be offline. So you're all welcome to join us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Munarken. Um, It's really important that we talk about burnout. And uh, I will, we'll be talking 
uh, the level of the town hall, but I think the town hall will certainly make some commitments, uh, Dr. Ikiti, to see if you can look for some uh, really uh, enthusiastic students in the Faculty of Medicine who might want to just get some mentorship for, from you to work on a paper on burnout so we can actually finance it at the level of the town hall. We will be able to provide the resources for such a person to do that. So before we come to talk about this, we have some baseline information that has been uh, uh, generated by, by, by the student or any other person you can find fit. So we'll be open to carry that conversation later on. Uh, maybe some last words from you before I close the session. Dr. Kitty. Again, I'll just you know say thank you all. Thank you, the moderators. Thank you, Elvis, Mono, Brian, <clears throat> Christelle. Thank you, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to be on this on this town hall. It's uh, it's still it's a real uh, something for me, experience for me to be here. Uh, I've heard about the town hall. I've followed the town hall. I've watched sessions. I've you know. Maybe it's one comment I made on one of the sessions that got me here. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a, an immense pleasure for me to share my experience. I am open to, to you know, whatever, you know, anybody from this town hall would require of me, whether it be mentorship of students who want to do research, because I'm very driven by research. I believe a lot in data. Um, open to any communication, networking, whatever it is that, you know, you think that my experience or my, 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 my position or what I've known or what I've done in the past has been, if it can help you in any way, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to volunteer whatever services I, I, I have, whatever time I have to be able to contribute to some of these things. Thank you very much once again for tuning in to everyone and uh, see you in the parking lot. Thank you very much and truly see it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are almost coming to the end. I'll do a little short summary for those who uh, came in late, but uh, be reminded that we always download all the sessions of our town hall, edit it and put on our YouTube channel where we have lots and lots of other previous presentation. Last edition, we're talking about improving cancer and reducing mortality in Cameroon. You can find all the very exciting topics we've covered all in the past uh, almost three years today, hosted on our uh, YouTube channel. So today we're talking about the state of occupational health medicine in Cameroon and asking the question, are we doing enough to protect the health of workers? So we uh, had a very great presentation by Dr. Ekiti, who defined occupational medicine as that, that, uh, as that which is concerned with the maintenance of health in the workplace, with the sole objective of also improving our productivity. He said that the team that uh, comprises of uh, doctor, nurses, a hygienist, a staff, and HR is what we need in order to set up an occupational health unit in uh, uh, within a facility or a workspace. And he gave uh, a statistic that was interesting about 11% of growth in low and middle income countries between the year 1993 and 2013 was due to improvement in occupational health. Uh, the practice of occupational health can take place in two, uh, in two places. One can be in an accredited institution like Sonera or maybe by a private practitioner or someone doing it as a consultancy. Ikiti also outlined some of the tasks that is done by the occupational health team. He said one was the assessment of fit for work test. Uh, this can be done at the end during entry of work or return for those who have taken out some time and are coming back to work. He also talked about the health risk uh, evaluation and mitigation, uh, routine medical visits, uh, primary care of target population, uh, medical affairs and regulation that which Mona did, and, and also the health uh, promotion. Uh, so the question was, what can we uh, really do or what more can we do? It was interesting to know that chronic disease accounted for almost 80% of work-related uh, deaths and uh, a lot of compensation, as he pointed out, by organizations that he cited that are doing almost really like uh, uh, best practice in occupational health in Cameroon, which is CMPS, that despite that, they pay more attention to work-related injury, not work-related disease. But of course, he also really emphasized how much of importance we have to pay to work related disease that are, of course, difficult to actually uh, assess because sometimes it takes time for workers to actually uh, 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 suffer from some of this disease that might be due to the work that they have been performing. And uh, up to about a third of the world 
uh, of population are suffering from musculoskeletal disorder. We, we, we actually talk about the situation of those who are sitting down to work and pictures of those who actually sit on their carpet to work and how this can have a long time impact on their health, but how difficult it is to trace it back to their job and hold their uh, employers uh, uh, accountable. He talked about the need for mental health and that this uh, mental health alone uh, uh, accounts for a lot of absenteeism and a new word I learned today, presentism. Uh, the fact that you can be at work, but not at performing at your optimum. Uh, Ekiti also demonstrates how occupational health can help uh, pre prevent disease. For example, he cited the case of uh, the Mbanjok sugar cane farm, where a study showed that just uh, re uh, providing water uh, at the workplace was able to account for some of the reasons why the workers in this, uh, in this particular uh, uh, industry had lower uh, prevalence of CKDs compared to uh, statistics that were uh, uh, done in other related, related studies. So this is just to say that uh, when you have a very good occupational health team in place, they can carry out just very little acts that can really be transformative in terms of just preventive prevention of uh, very uh, chronic health uh, conditions among workers. Ikiti also emphasized the need for mental health in the workspace and said the place of work should be, or we should make the workspace that which will make workers to enjoy their job and not endure their job. And he was really also embarrassed about the fact that a systematic review did not show any data of a uh, study that was done in Cameroon. That was just trying to say, what can we do as uh, Cameroonians back home and abroad? Uh, we can uh, try as much as possible to advocate for creating mental health units in the different companies, be the ones you work for or the ones you care about. And we should intentionally uh, collect occupational health data that can inform uh, a, a drive or change in policy. Uh, he also uh, said we should encourage students who are interested in occupational health to intern in occupational health facility. Of course, we had the good news that now in the Faculty of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, there is also the, the department that is in, in charge of training occupational health uh, physicians. So this is a great improvement. We all agree that there is a need to uh, get some more work done at the level of uh, government uh, workers. And we are looking further to see if it might be possible to bring the Minister of Labor and the Minister of uh, of uh, uh, public uh, service just to have a conversation and discussion on what effort they can do to improve work, uh, the health of uh, workers because Cameroon government appears to be one of the largest employer. Of course, uh, enforcement of occupational health is being done by the Minister of Labor. And uh, we have heard from other participants that uh, leaving it in their hands alone have not proven to be the best, but there is much that can be done if we engage other stakeholders just to see how we can improve on occupational health. This is all we could gather. A lot more was said. You can listen it when you tune into our YouTube channel and follow the recorded version. Ladies and gentlemen, it was really nice having you on this session. And as usual, we wish you a very wonderful weekend and see you in a fortnight. Enjoy your weekend.